United States Football League, just four more weeks of the regular season to go, followed by the playoffs. We'll be covering three games regionally today, and we'll have bonus coverage of one. Here's the rundown. Many of you will be seeing the New Jersey Generals, 11-3, against the Tampa Bay Bandits, 10-4. Both teams in the hunt for the number one wild card berth in the Eastern Conference. Some of you will see a battle of division leaders, the Houston Gamblers with the sensational Jim Kelly, against the Denver Gold, which are 8-6 and six and leading the Pacific Division. Bonus coverage today of the Los Angeles Express against the Washington Federals, as L.A. with their 31 rookies tries to make the playoffs. And some of you will see the Arizona Wranglers, the height of erraticism, against the very strong Birmingham Stallions. I'll be back in a few minutes with a full setup. But now, for more on the ball game you'll be seeing, let's go out to the ballpark and your respective announcers. George Blanda played professional football longer than any other player in the history of the game. His strong leg prolonged his career, but his arms set the record we're interested in today. 36 touchdowns in a single season, 1961. Also in the early 60s, Y.A. Tittle led the New York Giants to three straight championships. In 1963, Tittle tied George Blanda's record with 36 touchdowns. And today, Jim Kelly of the Houston Gamblers has a chance to tie and perhaps break the long-standing record held by two of the game's all-time greats. Leading the Gamblers' wide-open attack, Kelly has thrown 34 touchdowns to date. Six times this season, he has thrown for three or more touchdowns in a single game. If he matches that mark today, the record will be his. We are in Denver, Colorado, where the graceful skyline sits in the shadow of the Rockies. Mile High Stadium is the setting for today's game between two division leaders. It's the Houston Gamblers with a five-game win streak on top of the Central Division against the Denver Gold, the leaders in the Pacific Division. Hello again, everybody. I'm Tim Brandt. There is no question but the fact that we've got one of the most prolific passers in the game of football today. This team lives up to its nickname, the Gamblers, and they run and they shoot. Kelly has assaulted virtually every record in the USFL. He is within reach of the prize statistics held in the history of this game, and today he may just about do that. I don't think anybody can appreciate those skills more than a fine former quarterback by the name of Lee Groskup, and how difficult is it for a rookie to grasp this offense? Tim, very quickly, uh, Mouse Davis told me yesterday that despite the difficulties, that Jim Kelly has improved as much as any quarterback that he's ever worked with during one season. He's surrounded by record-setting receivers. Well, they've got a, a, two guys, part of a group known as the Mouseketeers, Johnson on the left, Sanders on the right. Johnson, let's take a look at him first. He has already set a USFL record with 93 receptions. He's a former running back and played for the gold here last season, felt he was misused. He's back home and he has a point to prove. Now, Sanders is the fastest man on the team with 4-2 speed. He, too, is a former running back. And these guys have big play capabilities. And, of course, Houston is a big play team. Okay, so we're just about set. It's the Gamblers in the goal. Two division leaders will have the kickoff. And Jim Lampley will have a USFL report right after these messages. Stay with us. Two division leaders. A reminder that we'll be keeping you up to date on what happens between the Los Angeles Express and the Washington Federals. The Express at 7-7, seven and seven, an integral part of the playoff puzzle in the Pacific Division, the tightest division in the USFL, with all four teams having at least a mathematical shot of making the playoffs in that division. Of course, the leader is Denver. Just behind them, the Los Angeles Express, Arizona, and now the Oakland Invaders are in the playoff picture. Last night, the Oakland Invaders won for the sixth consecutive time after their nine losses, which opened the season. 29,687 were in Oakland Alameda Coliseum to see the Invaders as they beat the Jacksonville Bulls 17 to 13. The key in the game, of course, was the play of the Oakland defense, which has improved so much in recent weeks. Highlights of the ballgame Fred Bassana, the Oakland quarterback, opened the game with 17 consecutive completions. Among them, this five-yard second quarter touchdown pass to Brian Williams that gave Oakland a 7-3 lead. They controlled the ball game throughout. Jacksonville too riddled by injuries to score much now as Tom Newton's three-yard run in the fourth quarter made it 17-6 Oakland. Their star player, Eric Jordan, didn't even play in the ball game. You'll recall that Oakland won the Pacific Division last year with a record of 9-9. Nine and nine. They may be able to duplicate the feat again, but this 9-9 nine and nine would be one of the most bizarre accomplishments ever in football. Also last night, the Chicago Blitz beat the Oklahoma Outlaws 14 to nothing. The seventh loss in a row for the Outlaws this game before 17,100.
195 in Skelly Stadium in Tulsa. In the first quarter, Gary Worthy set up the blitz in scoring territory with this catch of a Vince Evans pass, put the ball down deep, and moments later, Vegas Ferguson was able to punch it in with a one-yard run that made it 7-0 in favor of the blitz. Later in the fourth quarter, another touchdown for Larry Canada on a 14-yard run. Doug Williams in the ball game for Oklahoma, 9 of 19 for only 25 yards and two, uh, two interceptions, I should say. The season that began so well for Doug Williams has descended into a nightmare for him and the Oakland Invaders. Of course, or I, I should say for the Oklahoma Outlaws. Of course, all the teams in the Pacific Division are also affected in their playoff hopes by what happens elsewhere in the Western Conference in the Central Division. You can see Houston and Michigan and Oklahoma still in mathematical contention, although Oklahoma is sinking fast. And speaking of the Chicago Blitz, Eddie Einhorn's group has finalized its purchase of a Chicago franchise to replace the Blitz. Still unclear whether that team will play in Soldiers Field or perhaps in Comiskey Park where Einhorn has an end with the Chicago White Sox. Einhorn went on record yesterday on ABC Sports Beat here with Howard Cosell as being among the USFL owners who favor an eventual move to fall football and direct competition with the NFL. Friday night, the Michigan Panthers finally won after all of their miseries in recent weeks. An overtime victory over the San Antonio Gunslingers, 23 to 17 before 16,384 in Alamo Stadium in San Antonio. The key to the ball game, 22 seconds into overtime. Oliver Davis with a 22-yard interception return against Rick Neuheisel. This was the winning play. Davis took it in for the touchdown, and that gave Michigan a 23-17 win. And the Panthers, despite all of their difficulties, still in mathematical contention for a playoff berth or perhaps even for the division championship in the Central Division. Elsewhere in the USFL this weekend, Friday night, Memphis beat New Orleans 20-17. Memphis now 7-8 and, and in mathematical contention for a playoff berth. New Orleans dropped to 20-17 and the New Orleans loss clinched a playoff spot wild card for the New Jersey Generals, though the Generals still want the number one playoff berth in the Eastern Conference. Tomorrow night, Pittsburgh at 3-11 journeys to Philadelphia to play the Red Hot Stars. Stars will be gunning for their 12th win in a row. A year ago, they clinched the Atlantic Division Championship in the 15th week of the season. And if New Jersey were to lose today, Philadelphia may be in position to do that again. NCAA track and field yesterday. Many of you probably watched our telecast here on ABC Sports, but may not know who won the team championship since we concluded our telecast prior to the time that they had been decided. The men's championship was won by Oregon's Ducks under coach Bill Dellinger, their fifth team championship. The star, of course, the brilliant Brazilian runner Joaquin Cruz, who doubled in both the 800 and 1500 meters and ran the fastest 800 meters in the world this year. Women's title won by Florida State Sprinters, anchored by Randy Givens, who had victories in the 100, the 200, and ran on winning 4x400 four and 4x100 four meter relay teams. Halftime today, we will have an update on the condition of Indianapolis 500 automobile racer Patrick Bedard, who had the spectacular crash in the race which we televised a week ago here on ABC Sports. You'll hear from Bedard from his hospital room today. That's at halftime, but first there's a full half of United States Football League football coming up, and we'll be taking you back out to the ballparks immediately after these messages. ABC Sports presents... The 15th week of the United States Football League. Today's game has the Houston Gamblers, the leaders in the Central Division, against the Denver Gold, the top team in the Pacific Division. Two of the best in the West, it's the USFL. The United States Football League is an exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. Today's game is sponsored by Lowenbrow. When you want the taste of a truly great beer, there's really only one. By Renault, makers of the Renault Alliance, Encore, and the new Fuego Turbo. For European technology and affordability, Renault is the one to watch. By Canon, proud to be the world's leader in 35mm photography and the official 35mm camera of the 1984 Olympics. And by Wagner, the right tool for painting. A good crowd to watch the Houston Gamblers, who are 9-5. and five. A win today can keep them two games up on the defending champion Michigan Panthers, while Denver is 8-5. and five. They are holding a slim one-game lead over the LA Express. Los Angeles is playing in Washington today. The weather in Denver? 
simply gorgeous. The temperature, 76 degrees. There is a light breeze, chance of rain 40%, but that chance has been here all weekend and the sun has been shining clearly in the shadow of the Rockies. Well, Denver has won the toss. Tony Fritsch will kick off the two deep men, Leonard Harris and Kevin Williams. Tony Fritsch, what a story he is. Long time Dallas Cowboy. This is Leonard Harris, number 80. And he is back there with his sidekick, Kevin Williams, who will wear number 86. Leonard Harris has a 25.7 yard average. Third best average in the league. His longest return, 74 yards. He's all United States Football League. That's Tony Fritsch. 16-year veteran, long time as he's been kicking that football. Soccer player in Europe. You see the longest, 74 yards by Leonard Harris, who is a speedster. He runs a 4-8-40. The kick is short. It'll be short hop by Leonard Harris. Harris finds a funnel, takes it inside. Leonard Harris to the 46-yard line. Fine return by Leonard Harris. The stop was made by Clarence Burdan, who had a 94-yard return last week. Leonard Harris out of Texas Tech, who is second in the Western Conference in returns, Tim, takes this ball, finds the funnel, picks up a great block there by number 86, Clarence Williams. Now watch this. It's Burdan, who is a speedster himself, who finally brings him down. Very opportune field position immediately for the Denver Gold as quarterback Fred Mortensen goes to work. It is first down, first play of the game for the Denver offense from the 47-yard line. Setbacks, Sidney and White. Morton's in the pass. Has nowhere to go. And he's going to lose a yard. Cleveland Crosby, number 78, is the man who made the sack. The offensive scheme, the quarterback, as we mentioned, Fred Mortensen, he's out of Arizona State. Fred has had two 300-yard games in the last three weeks. His setbacks, Harry Sidney and Vincent White. The wideouts, Elmer Bailey and Kevin Williams, number 86, is now in place of Leonard Harris. Victor Hicks is the tight end. And the offensive line, Rodgers, Yarno, Davis, Peyton, and Miller. Denver has not been a fast starting team in the first half. As a matter of fact, they've only scored 116 points in the first half all year. Vincent White, Bo Matthews are now your setbacks in the eye. Second and 12. This is White. He cuts it back up and gets to the 48-yard line where Calvin Eason makes the tackle. The defensive scheme for the Gamblers, Cleveland Crosby, Tony Fitzpatrick, Hosea Taylor, and Pete Caton. They are the four down linemen. They play a 4-3 scheme. Mike Hawkins, Kiki Diala, and Anthony Brock are your linebackers. Three very active linebackers. Reed Will, Mike Mitchell, Will Lewis, who has five interceptions, leads the team. Calvin Eason and Tommy Myers, a longtime veteran of the National Football League, and he plays like a coach on the field. Elmer Bailey come to the bottom of the screen. Twin receivers to the top are Leonard Harris and Kevin Williams. Shotgun formation on third and nine. This is Williams in motion. Inside Gill. Nowhere to go. He's here. Sydney looking for Mortensen. Mortensen's open. And he makes the grab and it's knocked away. Well, Mortensen had it in his hands and couldn't hold on because Will Lewis, the defensive back, was there to strip it away. But a little bit of fireworks and a little bit of ingenuity by Denver early. Harry Sydney now played quarterback at Kansas. He is a great all-purpose player. He was indeed a part-time quarterback at Kansas. His timing was thrown off there as he wanted to throw the option pass back to the quarterback sooner. This is one of several gadget plays they have. Will Lewis, number 24, is the closest man on the coverage there to Fred Mortensen, who was on a deep swing route after he handed off the football. You're looking at Brian Spielman, who's there to punt it away. His average, 36.9 yards per kick. He goes for the corner, and he gets it inside the 10 to the seven yard line, Ryan Spielman. A 45 yard punt by Spielman who took over for Steve Gortz when Gortz was injured. Punted so well they hung on to Brian Spielman and released Steve Gortz. So Jim Kelly will start in a little bit of a hole. Kelly of course set a league record with completion percentage last week hitting 20 of 23 passes. 86.9%. He is your quarterback, Todd Fowler is your lone setback. Richard Johnson, Ricky Sanders are two speedsters. The wideouts, Gerald McNeil and Greg Moser. 
Ernie Rogers, Scott Boucher, Frank Calio, and Billy Kidd are in the offensive line along with Tommy Robinson. First and ten, they mark it at the seven. Kelly to throw, does complete. That's Ricky Sanders. John Bungarts, the linebacker, makes the stop, but now Kelly is one for one. Let me expound upon what Kelly did last week. 362 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. He scored a touchdown. The defensive scheme is a 3-4 for Denver. Dave Stalls, the longtime veteran, is at one end along with Calvin Turner. Pat Ogren, number 79, will man the middle. The linebackers, well, they're going to be loaded today. It'll be Kelvin Newton, Bungart, Matthews, and Greg Gerken. And the secondary, David Martin, Miller, Dumars, and Steve Trimble out of the University of Maryland. But we may see six and seven defensive backs. Today they load up with nine men on the line. They bring the stunt incomplete. Fine defensive play by Greg Moser. It was intended for Greg Moser, but David Martin broke it up. This is one of the things I think will be important today. Look at the pressure right here on Jim Kelly as he tries to unload to Greg Moser there. Matthews is in there. Hood, Harper. That's the kind of thing that's going to be important today for the gold if they're going to have be effective in stopping Jim Kelly. To put it simply, they want to put a lot of pressure on Kelly. The last time they had five linebackers in there and they came and loaded up with defensive backs. Again, you've got four down linemen. You've got the linebackers rolled up on the outside on second and ten. And again, they come with pressure. And again, it's incomplete. And now there's a flag. Bruce Thornton is the man who leveled Jim Kelly, but the flag is upfield, and I believe it's going to be called on number 23, Nate Miller, in the defensive secondary of Denver. Well, it is going to be called interference against Nate Miller, number 23. But if there's one thing that has to be encouraging right now for the Denver goal is that they are using an awful lot of pressure on Kelly, Illegal Chuck, defense number 23, first down. 23 is Miller, but again, they put a lot of pressure on Kelly. and make it As you said, the penalty occurred upfield, but look at Jim Kelly as he sprints to his right. The pressure applied by number 60, Bruce Thornton. He and Dave Stalls have made a difference in the sack department. Denver was the worst team in the league last year in sacks. The penalty gives the Gamblers a first down from the 29, so they've worked out of a hole. This is Fowler, who takes it across to the 36-yard line. And in the last four games, Fowler has averaged 117 yards, which is a six-yard average. It's going to be fun trying to keep an eye on the defense of the goal today and see what they're doing. They're mixing it up quite well. Maybe you can expound upon that, Lee Gross Cup since you've looked at so many defenses in the past. The Gold are going to be mixing it up on almost every play today. We'll talk more about that momentarily. Three down linemen this time. They show a 3-4 nickel defense. Again, it's Fowler. First down, Gamblers. Steve Trimble, the defensive back, comes up and makes the stop, number 47. But Fowler, who used to be a tight end in college, can ramble. He's a tight end out of Stephen F. Austin. He's a rookie. He has the size you like. 220 pounds and he's a he's not a flashy player Tim but he's very dependable doesn't fumble very often got nine yards on that carry now two carries for 16 yards I think what's impressive about Fowler is the fact that he came in replaced Sam Harrell and Harrell has sat down and now three 100 yard games in a row for Fowler a little slip screen underneath the Fowler and he's taken down in a hurry so they lose a yard this time Denver obviously had this play well scouted, Tim. It's the screen to the flow side. Watch it. Screen to the flow side, to the fullback, to the eye back Fowler. And look who's coming through there. It's number 21, David Dumars. That play, remember, went for a touchdown for them earlier in the season. It's been one of their effective plays. I'd say right now, Denver has done a good job of scouting the run and shoot. Well, what they're doing, and quite frankly, it's a it's, uh, pretty good scheme defensively, is they've got five people back there, nickelbacks. They're dropping off the linebackers and doubling on the wide receivers. Everybody's playing man. And on second and 12, Kelly has trouble finding a receiver and goes down. So there is 
relentless pressure on the quarterback Jim Kelly with whom we spoke. Pat Ogren is the man in the middle, longtime Washington Redskin, whom Bobby Beathard, the general manager in Washington, said had unlimited potential. Pat Ogren, number 79, coming from the middle as we look at Richard Johnson, number 22, in isolation, trying to get open in combination with Ricky Sanders, number 80. And you saw that Kelly just slipped as he was trying to throw the ball that time. Pat Ogren was the man first applying the pressure. Well, Hempel, number 25, was the man back there. And, of course, we mentioned they were playing nickel. A lot of linebackers. And you can see this defensive scheme is relentless in its pressure on Kelly. It is third and 12. The pass is to Richard Johnson. They rule it complete. He did lose the ball before he went out of bounds in midfield, and that's where they'll mark it. Richard Johnson, we mentioned, played for the Denver Gold last year. He was a running back, felt that he was misused. Now is the slot back in the run and shoot in combination once again. Runs the sideline cut and is brought down along the sideline by number 27, Anthony Allen. Not to be confused with the receiver, Anthony Allen, who now plays for the Michigan Panthers. So it brings up fourth and five punting situation. You're looking at Dale Walters, the rookie from Rice. The deep man is David Martin, number 13. He's an all-pro punt returner for the Denver Gold, but he won't have a chance here. So we've got a lot of action early. Denver looks strong defensively. Kelly having trouble. Our game is scoreless after that 30-yard punt. You're looking at Jack Pardee, the head coach of Houston. He's been the head coach of the Florida Blazers in the World Football League, the Chicago Bears, the Redskins, and now he's back in this league with the Houston Gamblers. On the other side, Craig Morton, longtime quarterback with the Dallas Cowboys, came to Denver, had some of his best years here, taking the gold, or the Broncos, rather, to the Super Bowl, and now he has to be happy with what he's seen so far out of his defense. They are at the 20. Two tight ends, Bob Nazolik, Victor Hicks, Harry Sidney, the lone setback. Mortensen is your quarterback. First down, pressure tries to drop the ball to Sidney, and it's knocked down by Hosea Taylor. Well, Lee Gross Cup, this is fun. They've come with six defensive backs at the Denver goal. They've come with five linebackers. We've even seen them drop Pat over in the nose tackle off into coverage and take the lone setback being Fowler. When we talked to Denver officials yesterday, they indicated that there would be times when all defensive linemen would be out of the game and they would be covering exclusively with linebackers and defensive backs. John Arnold, 84, Leonard Harris, your wideouts. The two setbacks, White. And White has the football out to the 28-yard line. Let's go downstairs now to our colleague, Jim Bergamo. All right, thank you, Tim. With me, linebacker Greg Gherkin. Uh, Greg, no secret what you're going to try to do. Your first two plays, no down linemen, all linebackers and defensive backs. Right. Uh, we're going to try to mix it up a lot. Uh, we feel playing that, you know, it might throw some of their keys off. We might be able to get some big plays. And uh, that's what we got to do. we got to get some big plays and turnovers, and I think we can win the game. All right, thank you, Greg. Everybody in tight for the gold now. Big play for the offense, third and one. Bo Matthews, Harry Sidney of the setbacks. This is Matthews. Tries to get the corner. Can't, as a matter of fact, to lose two yards. And Denver will have to punt it away. So Brian Spielman will come back on to do the punting for Denver. Watch the effort by number 34, Calvin Eason. As we look at Bo Matthews trying to get outside, he is to the right of your screen. He's the first man up on the support there. And then a whole host of Houston tacklers follow up. Fine job filling by Easton because it was the outside contained man who was hooked. The corner was the goals to take and he came up from his cornerback position and made the tackle. Ryan Spielman averaging 36 yards. <laughs> Gerald McNeil, you saw him number 13 in the white for Houston. This takes him back to the 34 yard line. Picks up one block but that's as far as he's gonna go. So Gerald McNeil goes down rather rudely by the tackle made by Daryl Hemphill. A 39-yard punt by Spielman, number three, and our score remains scoreless.
This program is being brought to you as an exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. Now let's pause five seconds to allow our local stations to identify themselves. KGO TV, Channel 7, San Francisco. The Houston Gamblers, highest scoring team in the United States Football League, 478 points. 34 point per game average, first ever 500 point season is within reach. They need 35 points to break the Houston Oilers all time record. On the 38, first down, Fowler, right side, picks up four. Before John Bungarts makes the tackle. You know, a film breakdown of the gambler offense shows that the gamblers run the football 45% of the time on first down. Todd Fowler is the, the lone setback, draws, traps. Sat in my room all weekend and figured that out. Draws, traps, dives, counters, and occasionally the option play where Kelly will either run the ball himself or pitch. But it doesn't seem like they run it 45% of the time. No. They just sneak it in there. Second and five. Five linebackers, six defensive backs for the goal. Again, there's pressure on Kelly. Incomplete, almost intercepted. McGee was the intended receiver. David Martin knocked it away. Right now, let's go to New York. Here's Jim Lampley. The Los Angeles Express had fallen behind early. Tim Brandt, seven nothing to the Washington Federals, but now they've come back and scored on what is rapidly becoming their trademark: a five-yard rollout by Steve Young. His running talent, so much a part of their improvement. It's seven-seven, LA and Washington now in the first quarter. Back to Tim Brandt. They get better every week. Los Angeles. 14 players that would have been taken in the first or second round National Football League they continue to mesh together don't be surprised to see him in the championship game third and five from the 43 for Jim Kelly and his gamblers this is Fowler inside first down cross midfield well when you put five linebackers in and six defensive backs when you mix things up and look for defensive schemes that time they were in a nickel you're susceptible to runs like that that's exactly the point with that kind of a look, you can go inside quick with a fullback like Fowler. Means that a guy like Steve Trimble, out of your alma mater, the University of Maryland, has to make the tackle in the secondary. I know you like Steve Trimble because he's a hitter. He is that. He's a headhunter. Seven-yard pickup for Fowler. He now has 28 yards and four carries. Trimble's the kind of guy that'll hit you early just to let you know he's in the neighborhood so that you look for him the rest of the afternoon. Kelly, slip screen to Fowler on first down. And he's up close to another one. They'll give him nine yards on that play. So it'll bring up second and one. This is a variation of a uh, play that uh, we call the Utah pass. My old coach Cactus Jack Curtis had something very similar to this when we were at the University of Utah. Fowler takes the ball, falls in behind a wall of blockers. Pat Ogren, number 79, is the man who makes the tackle there. A lot of gadgetry. A lot of gadgetry and big plays by the Houston Gamblers. First time Houston has been in Denver territory in this ball game. We've got 525 remaining in the first quarter. Sanders in motion. Sprint to the right. Sanders is the man and he runs out of bounds. First down at the 36 yard line. And I repeat, Houston has scored 114 points in the first quarter. Ricky Sanders, a former running back out of Southwest Texas State. I covered him where he was the most valuable player in the 1982 Palm Bowl. Breakout pattern, slides to the outside, simply slips along the sidelines, and is close to the first down yard marker. Five linebackers, six defensive backs for the Denver goal. Ricky Sanders goes to the top of the screen, shaking his head at the bottom. Number 89, Clarence Ferdan. Sanders in motion, foul of the ball carrier, has a hole. This is Trimble, and Trimble rides him inside the 25 to the 21-yard line. Steve Trimble, who's just 180 pounds, goes piggyback with Fowler, who's up near 220. He is exactly 220, 6'4", 220 pounds, a rookie out of Stephen F. Austin. It's that counter play again, Tim. And you can see that with that kind of alignment defensively, that that is going to be effective for the Houston Gamblers. Dang it. There are the numbers on uh, Fowler. He's listed at 218. We've also heard 220. 
Ballard now has 42 yards and needs 39 yards to pass Harrell as the Gamblers leading rusher. Reloads. Kelly throws and it's almost intercepted. David Martin had the ball in his hands, almost had the interception, dropped it, and he is upset with himself now. As we said, Tim, the run-and-shoot offense involves a total read on the run, both by the quarterback and by the wide receivers. If that read is incorrect, sometimes you will see passes like this. Now, it is either overthrown or underthrown, depending on your point of view, but be that as it may, there's a near interception by Martin, number 13. Sanders, number 80, is the intended receiver, or possibly Mosier, number 85. Very complicated offensive scheme. All Kelly does is call the formation and snap count in the huddle. Then the receivers read on the run, and Kelly reads the receivers. This is the draw to Fowler. To the 10, to the 7-yard line. Big Todd Fowler, and he just buries David Dumars in the secondary. The draw play has been far and away their most effective running play. Look at it here as Kelly starts to sprint to his right, slips the ball to Fowler, starts inside, then ducks outside, is in the secondary. David Dumars, who set an interception yardage return record last year, is the man who makes the tackle. The Gamblers have scored an incredible 62 touchdowns coming into this game. They've outscored their opponents 132 to 45. First and goal from the seven. Fowler, hold. Touchdown, Houston. Ernie Rogers, Scott Foucher made the blocks, and Fowler took advantage and rambled into the end zone for the Gamblers' touchdown. Once again, it's the counter play. Look at the work of Scott Boucher, number 60, and Rogers, number 73. That springs Fowler into the end zone. Tony Fritch, a 16-year NFL veteran, also played eight years of professional soccer, Tim. A man down for the gold. It appears to be Bill Matthews, number 51. Well, Fowler now has 64 yards from seven carries. He has the touchdown as they work on Bill Matthews of the Denver Gold. And now they'll bring on Tony Fritsch to attempt the extra point. Fritsch is 52 of 53 in extra points. Played soccer in Europe, and that's where the Dallas Cowboys found him. Signed as a free agent in 1971. Picked up two Super Bowl rings while he was with the Cowboys. One more look at the last touchdown. Watch the aforementioned blocking in the line. And there is a great hole right there for number 46, Todd Fowler. Rodgers and Boucher particularly, but almost everyone along that front five gets the job done for the Gamblers. Looks as if Matthews may be okay, just had his ticket punched a little bit. They worked on his right knee and his pants leg is pulled up there. Ticket hope, punched. We hope he's okay. Ticket punched. Tony Fritsch, 52 of 53 extra points twice this year. He's kicked four field goals in a game. That was against Jacksonville and Pittsburgh. Had four field goals last week. No question about it. So the Houston Gamblers are on the board first in the shootout in Denver. Our score, 7-0. Big offensive series for Todd Fowler, the lone setback for the Gamblers. He has now passed Sam Harrell as the Gamblers' leading rusher. They drive, nine plays, 62 yards, four minutes, 17 seconds. We saw every kind of defense conceivable. An imaginative scheme set up by Craig Morton, the Denver coach, as Tony Fritz will kick it away. And he drives this one into the end zone where Leonard Harris will make the... The catch, pick it up in the end zone and down it. So with time out on the field, we'll take on as well with our score, 7-0 Houston. We had hoped that the injury to Bill Matthews was not serious. 
but now we understand he has ligament damage in his right knee and let me just update you that Bill Matthews has had arthroscopic surgery already this season that is never good news when you hear that someone has had ligament damage to the knee a lively crowd at Mile High Stadium this afternoon we retreated to a concert by the group Alabama prior to this ball game and this crowd is wired first in 10 from the 20 for Mortensen it's going to be false start by Harris, I think, Tim. False start, offense number 80. Our referee today is Dave Kamansky. Arthur McCullough is the head linesman. Right now, let's go down to Jim Bergamo. Thank you, Tim. With me is Todd Fowler, who accounted for 64 yards of Houston's yardage on that last touchdown drive. Todd, uh, it looked like it's an old story. You're just taking what they're giving you. If they're going to line up with a lot of defensive backs, you're going to run on them. Uh, yeah, that's right. And our offensive line has done a good job uh, on, the, on the traps and the draws and stuff like that. And they're knocking big holes to give me a chance to get the secondary. All right, Todd. Good luck. Okay. After the penalty, they move Denver back five. First and 15. This is the running back, Kevin Williams, who takes it to the right side. Tempers flare a little bit. He gets back to the 20-yard line. Kevin Williams out of USC, normally a wide receiver, Tim, from time to time will line up as the eye back, and practically every time they have had him in that position, they have pitched to him. Obviously, what they're trying to do is take advantage of his speed. He's a world-class sprinter, had 9-4 speed in the 100-yard dash, and has been a big play man for the gold. Originally started his USFL career with the Los Angeles Express. We've talked so much about the Houston offense today. I think we should mention the fact that the defense has given up 388 points. That's the most in the USFL, and they rank 14th in an 18-team league in pass defense. Mortensen wants to test it, and Williams can't hold on. Williams had the ball in his hands and simply dropped it. Fred Mortensen out of Arizona State, who we've been talking about, gets pretty good protection here. He's trying to find Kevin Williams across the middle, number 86. Ball was just flat dropped. Harry Sidney comes out of the ball game for Denver, as does Leonard Harris. Kevin Williams remains in with Vincent White. And Dave Preston sees his first action of the day. Two receivers to the top of your screen. It is third and 11 from the 19. Mortensen in trouble. Now has plenty of room on that side. He starts to tuck it away, does, to the 26-yard line. And Pete Caton, who came all the way from the backside, traces him down from the back. Mortensen out of the shotgun now is looking for a combination pattern on his left gets some pressure and starts scrambling to his right watch number 77 Pete Caton a four-year pro out of Eastern Illinois right there run him down along the sidelines Caton and Crosby both have 11 sacks apiece they have been active in that 4-3 alignment there are the numbers on Spielman he'll be punting deep to number 13 Gerald McNeil McNeil 18 returns he's got an 11-yard average Ironically, out of the 18 punts, he has fair caught the ball only twice, and this is a boomer. It drives him all the way back to the 20-yard line, and there's a clip. Vincent Kerrville will be the man who will be charged with the clip. But the punt was an attention getter, 54 yards. In this rarefied air of Denver, Tim, that ball will fly sometimes. Did not help us much yesterday when we were down there kicking <laughs> the football. I was going to say. Those of you who followed the career of Lee Grosskopf when he was the All-American in Utah, let me tell you, the arm is still there, but the body is not willing to pay the price. <laughs> He's barely walking today. He is very sore. Here's the call. Illegal box above the waist, number 83. Half the distance to the goal line. First down. Vincent Kerrville, number 83, is the man sighted right there. And you see clearly that he blindsides number 25, Daryl Hemphill, 
That is a clip. They called illegal block above the waist, but it is a clip as well as we saw in the replay. Good call. They see Kerrville. He's the guilty party, and it moves Houston back inside the 10 to the 9-yard line. The Gamblers run the ball 45% of the time on first down. We'll see what they do here. They're going to throw. This is Kelly. He's looking back, has backside pressure, and bounces the ball to Ricky Sanders, or Richard Johnson, rather. Number 22. And you know, it's easy to get those two mixed up, Sanders and Johnson. Look at the records by Jim Kelly. Sir. He's already broken Fred Bassana's single season mark for most passing yards. Single game record you see right there. Last week he had the highest completion percentage ever. 869 against Jacksonville. That is remarkable. Second and ten from the ten. Kelly fires, has a man, incomplete, almost intercepted. Steve Trimble was there. It was intended for Richard Johnson, who lost the handle. Trimble had the football, but couldn't hang on. Almost a big play by the former Terrapin. Richard Johnson in isolation here. Let's watch his read. He's going in motion from his left slot back to the right. Comes up here, and he sees that there is an opening right up the seam. However, that is closed up quickly by number 47, Steve Trimble, and also by number 13, David Martin. Richard Johnson, quite a story. Says he's been waiting for this game all year since he was on the Denver roster last year. Did not make a catch. And Richard's not shy about the fact that he wants to show off this afternoon. Third and ten. Kelly, with backside pressure, rifles the pass, and it's complete to number 80, Ricky Sanders on the sideline. It won't be enough for the first down. So the Denver defense rises to the occasion. Look at the uh, the pressure right here and the shot applied to Johnson along the sideline. Looky here, now it's Johnson getting the, the hit on Hemphill, number 25. Good shot. Dale Walters, number one, to punt it for Houston. The deep man is David Martin, all pro return man for the goal. He'll fair catch it on the 39. Dangerous play, but a fine catch. Only seven fair catches in 22 attempts. So he doesn't do it very often. A lot of ball games going on around the USFL today. Tampa Bay leads the general 7-0. A little bit of a surprise there. Tampa Bay playing extremely well. New Jersey still in the hunt for the championship in the East. Birmingham leads Arizona 7-0. George Allen reportedly in trouble as the head coach in Arizona. And look at this score, Lee Gross Cup. 7-7, the Express in Washington. This time of year, you see a lot of upsets. A lot of teams that were weak early in the year have gotten strong, particularly the Oakland Invaders. Red Mortensen, your quarterback. Two 300-yard games in the past three weeks. He has the ball on the 41. It's first down. Takes the draw, in trouble, has room. To the 47-yard line goes Fred Mortensen. Fred's quite a story. Did not play at all for the gold in the first quarter of this season, but when Penrose and Galliano went down, Mortensen was called back, and he responded to the challenge quite well. He is an interesting story. We'll amplify more on that. Fakes the draw right here. He's trying to throw a middle route, gets some pressure right there, and moves to his right. Now he pulls the ball down, and in the secondary, it's going to be linebacker Kiki Diala and also number 34, Calvin Eason. Few people know that Fred led Arizona State past Nebraska in the Fiesta Bowl when he was a senior. From the 47, it's second and four. Mortensen drops the football, gets it back at the 45. So it'll be a loss of two, and it'll bring up third and six. But that'll be the end of the first quarter. You heard the gun. Denver holds on to the football. Well, Fred Mortensen now will have to do some magic. He'll have six yards for the first. When we come back to start the second quarter, it's 7-0 Houston. Tim Lampley in New York. Just moments after a Ricky Ray interception and a stout to Ken Toller touchdown pass had given Birmingham the lead over the Arizona Wranglers, 
The Wranglers struck back on this 81-yard touchdown run by Tim Spencer. Not a small man, and the defensive back he outran here is potential all-star Chuck Clanton. And incidentally, Tim Brandt, not surprisingly, while Arizona and Birmingham are 7-7, Joe Cribbs was booed on his return to Legion Field today. Back to Tim Brandt. Okay, Jim Lampley, we've got a little bit of a switch here. Craig Penrose comes into the ball game now as quarterback of the gold. So Mortensen goes out. Third and six from the 45. Penrose sits in the pocket nicely, drops it across the middle, and the pass is dropped by Dave Preston, number 46. Well, Dave, well. Dave Preston, the hero last week, part of the play which Craig Morton has called the miracle. That was the 32-yard pass against San Antonio that gave the gold their first win in five weeks. Preston, former Denver Bronco, as is Rick Penrose. Spielman comes on to do the duty to give the football back to Houston. Strange year for Denver. 7-1 and one at one point, then lost five straight games. Or won five straight, rather, and then uh, they have lost five of the last six. This is a high punt, not a particularly long one. It will hit at about the 26, he gets a Houston roll and goes down inside the 24-yard line. Tim, as we look at the first quarter numbers, it's interesting to note there that Houston, despite the fact that they are a big play team, has also been a pretty good possession team. They have kept the ball longer than Denver, and in total yards, they have surpassed that 107 to 103. And in passing yards, look at that, 43 to minus 2. Mortensen was 0 for 2 in the first quarter and was sacked once for a minus 2 yards. That's why that stat looks that way. Craig Morton says that Denver needs five turnovers to beat Houston today. So far, there have been none. 14 minutes, 46 seconds remaining in the half. This is Fowler, breaks a tackle, and bulls his way to the 24-yard line before Tom Sullivan, the safety, can come up and make the stop. What I mentioned a moment ago was the fact that Houston, despite the fact that they are a big play team, is pretty good at possessing the football. They're keeping the ball for better than 30 minutes per game. Talking with Houston offensive coordinator Mouse Davis yesterday, he said he was very concerned with the chucking that was going on, the knocking around of his wide receivers. Now that is legal for Up the first five, five yards. yards. But then after that, of course, it's a hands-off policy. He says they are chucking him even after that, hanging on to him later, and it's not being called. This is second and eight for Kelly. Flags fly. Kelly has time. He's going deep. And it's incomplete. It was intended for number 22, Richard Johnson. The flyer out of the University of Colorado. You saw something right there, though, that's important. The strength of Jim Kelly's arm. He can throw the ball 70 yards or more if he needs to. The play, uh, the penalty rather, is against Denver. It looks like it'll be offsides. Boy, Johnson's quite a character. He says, be prepared to see a man, and I quote, better than Herschel Walker, better than Joe Cribbs, better than anybody, unquote. Offside, defense number 60, second down. Number 60 is Bruce Thornton. So it'll be second and three from the 30. And quite frankly, these are situations that you don't want to get the defense into and the opportunities you do not want to give Jim Kelly. Second and three, he can go long if he wants. Always come back on third down for the first. Richard Johnson in motion. Play action to the left. Again with time. The ball tipped nicely by the linebacker on that side, Greg Gerken, number 50. Well, that's number 27, Steve Trimble out of the University of Maryland. I told you he had a penchant for hitting backers, or hitting wide receivers, rather. He loves to get very physical. Both Anthony Allen and Steve Trumbull are physical backs, 47 and 27. And they also feel nicely on the run. Big third down play for the Gamblers right now, Tim. They need three for the first. Give is to Fowler, has a hole into the secondary, the 40, 50, it's a foot race to the 40, 30, down to the 20 yard line, to the 19 yard line goes Todd Fowler.
Well, it's no secret when you load up that many people, you have that many in the secondary, once he gets through and everybody's out on coverage, it's Katie bar the door. Here's a big play for the Gamblers because Fowler appears to be stopped almost at the line of scrimmage, but then he's wide open in the secondary. He's chased right there by number 50, Gherkin, and ultimately brought down by number 23, Nate Miller, who comes from his cornerback position over to the middle of the field to bring down Fowler. A 53-yard pickup. Now, the key to this offense that the Gamblers run is space. They spread everything out. They use the entire length of the field. And when they spread out the defense, there's nothing left in the middle. Fowler again, this time nowhere to run. Fowler has 119 yards already this afternoon. Since he took over for Sam Harrell, he has been very effective. Of course, Harrell, the leading scorer in the league, still with 94 points. Well, no, Trout has taken over that leadership now. But he was, for many weeks, the leading scorer in the USFL. Denver, of course, loaded up to stop Kelly's passing attack. Fowler now in the first half, 119 yards. It is the fourth 100-plus game in the last five for Fowler. The other one was 94 yards, so he was close. Second and 11, a little slip pass. That's McNeil, and McNeil doesn't have much out there on the wide flanker screen. So Denver continues to run to the football. Tried to execute the sideline screen that time. Played made, made popular by the Dallas Cowboys when they had Bob Hayes. That man out of Texas A&M is returning to Texas now after a 25-year absence. Of course, a fine defensive football player was Jack Pardee, very defensive-minded. What he's always done is surrounded himself with offensive-minded people. In Chicago, is Sid Gilman. In Washington, it was Joe Walton. And here, it's Mouse Davis. This is third and ten. Kelly looking for the throwback. Richard Johnson simply dropped the football. Well, Johnson wants to show up for the fans in Denver since he played college ball here and played for the gold last year, but so far it's been a rocky road. Richard Johnson on the outside here, motioned back toward the line of scrimmage. Now watch this, he lets it clear out. He's running the underneath pattern, and he just dropped the ball because he, he lost his focus. He did not concentrate and looked the ball into his hands. Look how upset he is there. He's mad at himself. One catch, eight yards. He's dropped two. This is Tony Fritsch. A 35-yard attempt, and it's good. So, four field goals last week. Tony Fritsch now 15-17 in the field goal department, and Houston leads 10-0. Eleven minutes, 16 seconds remaining in the first half from Mile High Stadium in Denver. Quite a story developing here. It hasn't been the arm of Jim Kelly. It's been the running of Todd Fowler, who has made the difference in this ball game with 117 yards. You're looking at Tony Fritz, who just kicked a 36-yard field goal. He is going to kick off to Leonard Harris. third best average in the league as long as we turn this year 74 yards look at Tony Fritz you think he's been pumping iron lately <laughs> he looks like he should be the chef in an Austrian restaurant doesn't he Tim <laughs> he played for the Austrian national soccer team professional soccer for eight years had no college experience signed by the Dallas Cowboys as a free agent in 1971 picked up two Super Bowl rings had 16 years of total NFL experience. He told me yesterday he has kicked in every major stadium in the world. Well, we've got a problem and a holdup down on the field. We'll wait for Dave Kamansky, the referee, to make the declaration on that. We told you about Tony Fritz. The deep man is Leonard Harris, and he led the Southwest Conference in punt and kickoff returns in 1983. Hey, Tony, here we go. So now the ball is reloaded. French looks ready. The Denver Gold headsets are reportedly out, which means that both sides now will have to, I believe, go without headsets. Isn't that a league rule? I believe you're right. You better double check that. Tony Fritch, a low line kick, which is muffed at the five, goes out of bounds at the three, and whether he touched it or not, no. So they'll have to kick off. The flags fly, and Tony Fritch will have another opportunity, only this time they'll move it back. 
Todd Fowler, who you see right there, the hero of the day for the Gamblers, has accounted for all of Houston's rushing yards. This was the play that set up the field goal. Tim, you mentioned the term space, the way Houston spreads the defense. Look how much room there is once Fowler gets into the secondary. Gherkin is in pursuit, but it's Nate Miller, number 23, who has to come clear over from his cornerback position to make the tackle. That 53-yarder ties the record for the longest gambler run. Todd Fowler right now is with Jim Bergamo. All right, uh, Todd, uh, did you anticipate running the ball this much when you came into the game? Uh, not really. We knew that was going to probably go with six, seven DBs and linebackers in the game. And uh, but when they do that, it opens up a lot with big linemen blocking on uh, the smaller guys. Now, that last play, you looked like you were stopped at the line of scrimmage, and you broke free, and there's no one to stop it. Well, well, they come with everybody on that. It was an all-out blitz and everything. If you break one pass, that you got a lot of running room. You're already over, un, over 100 yards. You must feel pretty happy. Right now, I am. We need to put some more points on the board, though. All right. Thanks, Todd. Well, 117 yards in the first half here. He now has 720 yards for the season. And he's averaged 117 yards for the last four games. Tony Fritz to kick it off again. This is even lower. It's taken by the up man, Ballot. What a catch by Ballot. Looks for a block at the 40. Up to the 43 and a half yard line. So Elmer Bailey makes a big play as the up back. Elmer Bailey out of Minnesota, of course, is one of the starting wide receivers. Probably the most consistent receiver they have had if you go all the way back to the training camp period. And he shows those good hands in making that catch right there. Craig Penrose comes back in at quarterback, and that is a big play, Lee Gross Cup. Good hands on a tough kick. He makes the catch and takes it back up to the 44-yard line, where Denver will have it first down. Penrose struck great back. This is Harry Sidney. Spins, turns, drives up to the 47-yard line. Straight drop back by Penrose. Let's go to Jim Lampley in New York. Well, Tim, while there's a shortage of good news for Denver out there, there's some good news for them in Washington, where the Federals, on a fourth and two play, after an offside penalty against L.A. on the field goal attempt, have gone in front with this touchdown pass from Hohenzee to Joey Walters for five yards. It's 14-7 Washington in the second quarter ahead of L.A. Back to Tim Brandt. Well, I'll tell you, Lance, that's a little bit surprising, although Joey Walters, one of the all-time leading receivers from the Canadian Football League. This is second and seven, and the ball's almost intercepted by Calvin Eason. The ball was poorly underthrown. It was intended for Bob Nazolik. Bob Nazolik, who has been inactive in recent weeks, having been replaced by Victor Hicks. He was a starter earlier in the year and a starter most of last season. He was running a seam pattern. He's up the right seam, Craig Penrose, trying to find him. Momentarily, he looked open. You mentioned the ball being underthrown, and it had been thrown a little bit higher with a softer looping trajectory. It would not have been batted away by number 34, Calvin Eason. Denver needs a big play. Third and seven. Shotgun for Penrose. Two wide outs, two slots. Penrose now feels the heat underthrows. The ball was intended to his back, Dave Preston. Kiki Diallo was out there and had pretty good coverage on Preston. So, the Boo Birds come out now and this crowd, which has been enjoying the weather here in Denver, starting to get a little bit disappointed. I think they were a little surprised to see Craig Penrose. Fred Mortensen has been moving the team effectively in recent weeks. We did not expect to see Penrose at all earlier in the week. He has braces on both knees right now. Bob Galliano was expected to serve in the backup role. And they have also recently acquired Ken Hobart out of the University of Idaho, who came over from Jacksonville. Denver has not gotten a first down yet this afternoon. Hey, what are all your numbers? Long count, trying to pull Houston off. Spielman has pressure. He goes down, there should be a flag, there is. McNeil will let the ball hit and go into the end zone, but Clarence Verdam tried to block the punt, hit Spielman, a big play, and now Denver will have first down. A 53-yard punt, but even more important than that is the fact that Denver gets the ball back, and that is the first first down of the game for the goal. Watch Clarence Verdan, number 89, come into your picture from the left side of your screen. 
Spielman tries to get the punt off, and right there, you see the infraction. This might give you a closer look at it, a clearer look. On the right side of your screen, watch Clarence Verdan come in. I don't know, that's awfully close, but he appeared to make contact. Of course, all punters are actors. A note that we should mention is the fact that during this skid by the Denver Gold, they've lost five of their last six. The offensive line has been extremely banked up. Greg Fiesel is still not back in the lineup. And the offensive line has not been intact during the entire stretch. Penrose is one for four, three yards. But they are in Houston territory with 9.43 remaining in the half. This is Vincent White. Gets his block, picks up a very tough two yards. And right now, they're in that dusty infield. We've talked about the all-purpose work of Harry Sidney, number 24, out of Kansas. Watch him here in the role as a blocker for Vincent White as he kicks out on the corner. He's blocking on number 54, Anthony Brock, right there. Does a pretty good job of sustaining the block. Number 37, white in motion. Second and nine. Harry Sidney, quite an effort. Spinning, turning, driving for a first down, but there is a flag. Holding against Denver. Another look at the effort by Harry Sidney. We've talked about his all-purpose capabilities, has consistently led the team in both rushing and receiving. There's the spin, there's the turn, there's the drive that Tim Brandt just talked about. Holding, offense number 62, second down. Watch the action to the right of the quarterback, number 62, Doug Payton, as he is using his hands illegally right there as Harry Sidney tries to go off the left side and does effectively. That hurts because that was a good gainer. Well, he's replacing the injured Greg Fiesel in the offensive line, which we just talked about. Unbalanced line, shotgun formation, second and 19, the ball is thrown, and it's complete. It's complete to Kevin Williams, who made a fine effort to keep his feet inbound. In this league, you need both feet inbounds to make the reception. He did that and made the catch. Kevin Williams along the sidelines here. Watch two feet. There they are. Couldn't ask for it done any better than that. A 15-yard pickup. It'll bring up third and four from the 32. We've got 8.48 remaining first half. Vincent White's only 5'8", 200 pounds. He's along with Harry Sidney, 220 pounder. This is third, four, shotgun formation. Penrose in the quarterback, has a man open, and it's knocked away nicely in the secondary by Mike Mitchell. Well, Bailey was open, and Mitchell recovered in time to knock it away. Penrose a little late with the ball. His timing may not be as sharp as he would like, Jim. Wearing two knee braces today. Earlier, he had arthroscopic surgery on one knee. Well, you can hear the crowd in the background yelling for the Denver goal to go for it on fourth and four. This crowd came for entertainment. They've already seen the group Alabama. Now they're going to get some entertainment here. Shotgun again. Penrose with time. Has a man. It's Vincent White. He makes the catch and spins for the first down. Or did he? We'll see where they mark the football. Oh, and is this marking ever so important? They'll call a timeout, and they'll bring in the change. Will Lewis and JoJo Heath were there to stop him. Vincent White, number 44, out of Stanford. Another outstanding all-purpose back. Running toward the sideline right here. Makes the catch between two defenders. Spins. 
and then lunges forward and pushes the ball forward. He has the first down. Fourth down, Houston went to his own defense. Penrose found the seam, White got the first, and Denver now to the 28-yard line of the Gamblers. Elmer Bailey comes to the bottom, Leonard Harris goes to the top. The slot back is Harry Sidney. One lone setback, unbalanced line to the left. Play action, Penrose going deep, has Sidney, touchdown Denver! into the crowd. The whole stadium's rocking. So Lee Gross Cup, they needed a big play and they got it. Craig Penrose changes boos to cheers. Play action fake. Looks first for Benny White. Now throws up the seam to Harry Sidney. Number 24 who splits it between Tommy Myers and Calvin Eason right there and catches the touchdown pass. Ryan Spielman to attempt the extra point. And it's good. So we mentioned that Harry Sidney was on the wing. He split the zone, and Denver's on the board. Penrose on this drive, three for four, and the touchdown. All right, with me, Craig Penrose, who just threw that touchdown pass. Craig, first of all, the question, why did you replace Fred Mortensen? Well, I just, uh, after Friday's practice, I just told Craig that I thought that my legs were starting to feel a little better and that if he felt there was a need to make a change, that I'd certainly like to have a chance to play. And... Uh, we kind of struggled a little bit in the first quarter. You just felt like maybe a change might help the team. So your knees are obviously good. You were not affected there in the beginning. Why all of a sudden did things start working? Well, I think we just broke down a little bit as a team. You know, I think there's some things that are that are available to our offense, but uh, it's just a matter of execution. And uh, if we can keep doing that each drive, you know, we're going to give these guys a good ball game. All right. Thanks, Craig. Good luck to you. Thank you. I want to know, Lee Gross Cup, is it a prerequisite if you're going to be a quarterback in the pro ranks to have salt and pepper hair? Does it give you that gray hair? I think the posi position is conducive to that, and, and there are a few of those in this league, a few of the gray-haired uh, quarterbacks. How about Greg Landry? 17-year veteran, Greg Landry. Ryan Spielman, and he's kicking to Clarence Verdan, who had a 94-yard return last week. He takes it four yards deep. Fakes a return, football. loses the football. And we've got some extracurricular activity all the way around the football. Old Billy Johnson was really going after it with Reggie Bonner back there. At the 10, the Gamblers do get the football back. But the feeling in the stadium now is electric. Tremendous emotional energy in the stadium as we look at Verdan, number 89, who had that big 94-yard return. Watch here. It appears that he's trying to fake a handoff right there, and maybe he made contact with the man who passed him. He lost the ball. It appeared momentarily that the gold had a shot at it. He recovered his own fumble. Verdan has 4-2-8 speed in the 40. Incredible speed. Fowler, straight ahead. Picks up a couple of more. Tough yards. He is part of a group of receivers, as we mentioned earlier, Tim, known as the Mouseketeers, after the offensive coordinator, Mouse Davis. So that'll bring up second down and about six for Jim Kelly. Greg Moser comes to the bottom of the screen. Johnson at the top. The motion man is number 80, Ricky Sanders. This is Sanders. He catches the ball on the wing. And look at the defense swarm the football. In Denver, they say happiness is pursuit. I like that. Happiness is pursuit. That's what a defense has to do to stop a team like Houston. Ricky Sanders in motion. 
from the right slot to the left. And now he's going to set up the sideline screen. But look how quickly the gold is there. Greg Gerken, number 50, the linebacker, is the first man there. And then along comes Steve Johnson, number 72. Scott McGee splits wide. Richard Johnson in motion. Third down and six. Kelly with room. Takes it all the way to the corner. Goes for the sticks. And he doesn't make the first down. And look at Bill Huther talking to Jim Kelly. Intimidating Kelly. Huther has just joined this club. Played for the Dallas Cowboys. Was released by Pittsburgh. Jim Kelly sprinting to his right now. Looking for a combination route on his right side. Todd Fowler gets a good block that springs into the corner. Bill Huther, number 59, is the man who makes a classic open field tackle along the sidelines on quarterback Jim Kelly. I don't believe this. We talked about how important the marking is. Well, right now, Craig Morton is tremendously upset with the officials. They marked it and gave him the first down. It certainly didn't look like he had the first down to me. It looked like he was about a yard short. Well, well. mentioned that Hunter made a fine open field tackle. Anytime a linebacker is going against the back, the key is to break down, get leverage so the offensive man doesn't have as much room to move. 547 first half. First down plays. Fowler and he takes a heck of a lick from Bill Hunter. Bill Hunter, who played earlier for the Cowboys and the Ballers, is 6'1", 220 pounds. He's 29 years old, has eight years of professional experience. And he might make a difference for this team. McGee and Richard Johnson come way to the bottom of the screen. They spread out everybody. They use the entire length of the field. Kelly on second down and long. Throws back across the middle of Johnson. Another first down for Houston. Richard Johnson, Timmy, you mentioned earlier, he's out of the Muhammad Ali school of hyping himself. Said that he's as good as anyone. Herschel, Joe Cribbs, anybody. And he wants to prove himself here. He's running the underneath pattern. Catches the ball in a crowd there. Earlier, he dropped one in a similar situation. Played for the University of Colorado. His, Richard, his brother, Daryl, is a senior halfback at Colorado right now. Johnson now has two catches, 17 yards. First down from the 37. Sanders just drops the football. And look at the frustration on Jim Kelly's face. Frustrated because those drop passes are drive killers. Ricky Sanders, we talked about out of Southwest Texas State, was a running back. Jack Pardee played for Bear Bryant at Texas A&M back in the 50s. His senior year was 1957. He was both a fullback and linebacker and was a former first-round draft choice of the Los Angeles Rams. Kelly, now 9 of 18 for 53 yards. Second and long from the 37. Kelly has a man, and it's complete. That man is Scott McGee. Nothing fancy about that, just a quick post pattern. We still have three minutes and 59 seconds remaining in this half, so Kelly is utilizing the clock extremely well. Scott McGee, another one of those Mouseketeers. He's 5'9", 172, a two-year player out of Eastern Illinois. Richard Johnson, who we spotlighted at the top of our show, you see his numbers not particularly impressive right now. Two receptions for 17 yards. On the 47-yard line, backside pressure. And Kelly is sacked. Now, we mentioned the fact that Kelly had been sacked more times than anybody in the league. He now goes down. That's the 67th time he has gone down this year. And that's one of the things that can be effective against the run and shoot 
Backside pressure that you just talked about. Backside blitzes. That time it was number 57, John Bungards, the linebacker, coming on Kelly's blind side. Watch it. Kelly starts to sprint to his right. Now here comes here comes John Bungards, number 57, and that's a seven-yard loss. Well, the key is there, Lee Gross Cup, that the man without a man over top of him has to drop back and pick up the backside pressure, and he's not doing that. Second and 17, the run and shoot offense in high gear on this play. It is complete to Ricky Sanders. He's got a first down. So they needed 17. They pick up 19. That's an important point. They can shift gears in a hurry with this run and shoot. They can lose yards and then gain them back so quickly. They can get behind and then come back so quickly. Earlier this year, they got three touchdowns behind against the Oakland Invaders. Came back to win handily. Really believe that this Denver defense has to stay in the face of Jim Kelly. 67 times he's been sacked. The record is 71. Head by Fred Bassano of Oakland. If you stay in his face, it makes it all that more difficult to read this difficult offensive scheme. We're approaching the two-minute warning. This is Fowler. Fowler is hit early and still dives ahead for a three-yard pickup. Kelvin Newton is the man who makes the stop. It's a gain of three. And we've got the two-minute warning with our score, 10-7 Houston. Coming into this ball game, Craig Morton said that Denver needed five turnovers to beat Houston. Well, they've been a little bit tardy in that. They have not forced the turnovers yet. They have had some opportunities. They had some Jim Kelly passes in their hands and simply dropped them. already has 128 yards rushing today. The USFL record is held by his teammate Sam Harrell who had 200 yards in a ball game against Chicago. Kelly on second and long. Across the middle has a man wide open. That is Ricky Sanders. Sanders down to the 15 yard line. Well now that they're down to the 15 league Rose Cup I would have to think that the best shot for them now was go ahead and melt the clock while they go ahead to score. Ricky Sanders, number 80, lining up in the right slot here. Kelly sprints to his left. Now watch the read by Sanders. He just falls into the open area of the defense right there, catches the ball, spins back to his right, and then is surrounded in the secondary by several Denver tacklers, including Tom Sullivan, number 32. Six catches for Sanders now for 66 yards. Third in the league on Johnson and Joey Walters. He now has 80 catches on the season. So there's timeout on the field. Houston driving again and threatening the goal. They lead by three. Cooking. Houston's drive started on the 14-yard line. They have now marched all the way down to the Denver 15. It is first down. We've got 132 remaining in the half. Inside handoff was Richard Johnson to the 10, the 5, to the 3 yard line goes Richard Johnson. There is a flag. Usually you feel that there would be a clip in a case like that, but we'll see. Holding against the offense, so move them back. The play from Johnson's viewpoint coming from the left slot takes an underneath handoff right there. And look at the athletic skills. Of Johnson right there. Dumars, the number 21 on the, the tackle. Number 85. Along with Bungo. First down. Number 85, illegal block above the waist. You know, that's Greg Moser. That's Greg Moser. Wide receiver. Richard Johnson holds USFL records for the most catches in a single game with, or single season rather, with 93. Most catches in a single game, 15 against Los Angeles. Tied the record for most touchdowns in a game. Three against Pittsburgh. He can make it happen. 20 yards for the first. Drops this one out. Again, it's Richard Johnson. He'll be shy the first down. Doesn't even get back to the original line of scrimmage. This is the previous penalty. It was on a, a crackback block there, and they called holding. 
borderline penalty. That could go either way. The biggest play in this drive for Houston was the first down, which was very controversial at best. And I'm not quite sure he got the first down, but they did give it to him. I don't think he had it, to be honest with you. The rain has started here in Denver. Light drizzle. Second and 14 for Kelly. Has a man. Touchdown. Ricky Sanders makes the catch. Touchdown. Kelly has thrown a touchdown pass in every game this season. Post pattern by Ricky Sanders, and the ball was on the money. It was there waiting for him at the goal line. So we bring on Tony Fritsch, who is 53 of 54 in his extra point attempts this year. His kick is up and it's plenty good. Well, a slight drizzle and Kelly has lit up the sky. Another look at the last touchdown. Jim Kelly sprinting to his right here in the run and shoot offense. Post pattern by Sanders, number 80. That is his seventh catch of the day for 84 yards of coverage by Sullivan. An 18 yard touchdown for Houston. Houston now has a commanding lead, 17-7. There's Ricky Sanders, caught the 18-yard touchdown. Ricky, of course, was the leading scorer at Southwest Texas last year. Played in only 10 games. Surprisingly, he was only the team's third leading receiver there. Well, they were a running team. I covered him in the 1982 Palm Bowl for the Division II Championship, where he was the MVP. Still hard to believe that any human being can run a 4 2 8 40 is Leonard Harris who gets a pretty fine return out to the 24-yard line, but it gives the offense only 29 seconds to work. First half. Look at Tony Fritz, he could be our hero. <laughs> that man is a living legend. 16 years in the NFL. Still and says, still says he's as good as any kicker in either league. Yep, he believes in himself. Prior to that. He had eight years of professional soccer experience with the Austrian national team. Would not be a bit surprised to see Denver try something out of the ordinary here. 29 seconds left, shotgun, Penrose. With time, throws, and it's complete. First down, Denver goes John Arnold. The clock stops in these situations. That rule similar to the college rule. A uh, first down in the final two minutes prior to halftime and the end of the game stops the clock. And inside the two-minute mark, too, we should mention that if there is a fumble, the ball can only be advanced by the offensive team. Good reminder. Let's go downstairs now. Jim Bergamo. Uh, it appears Jim Kelly is with me. It appears that uh, the shoot has gotten back into the run and shoot offense. Well, if we just keep executing, I get a little time out, we'll be all right. Receivers are starting to catch the ball. Richard Johnson finally got his hometown jinx out. He's uh, putting his mind in the game. We're starting to move the ball. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. All right. Jim Kelly, USFL Player of the Week twice already. Eight times he's thrown for over 300 yards in a game this year. Believe it or not, he was once recruited by Joe Paterno at Penn State as a linebacker. He was an outstanding defensive back in high school. This is not your basic key sheeting quarterback. He's 6'3", 215 pounds. He's strong. I remember that. Jim had a brilliant four-year career at Miami under Howard Schnellenberger and Earl Morrill. Quarterback Miami to 9-3 and three and 9-2 and two seasons in 1980-81. Was injured the third game his senior year. 21 seconds left for Denver. First half. Penrose goes deep. Was he inbounds? No, sir. Kevin Williams could not get the feet in that time, and they bring it back. Incomplete pass. Kevin Williams, who gave us a classic example of keeping two feet inbounds earlier, tries to emulate that same performance here, and you see that he does not do it successfully. He's clearly out of bounds. Good call by the official. Awfully close, though. That doesn't count in this game, though, does it? 
It counts in, in dancing sometimes. Four wide receivers in the ball game now for the Denver goal. Under 15 seconds. Victor Hicks has the catch. Flags fly. He's up to the 39-yard line. JoJo Heath throws up his hands as if saying, I did absolutely nothing. Defensive holding, number 32, first down. Yeah, that's JoJo Heath. Well, the last count, I saw Baltimore was leading Detroit today, 2-0, bottom of the seventh. Of course, the Orioles beat the Tigers yesterday, and coming up this Monday night, our first Monday night baseball game with Al Michaels, Howard Cosell, and Earl Weaver. That'll be Toronto and Detroit, the Tigers. Off to the quickest start, baseball history. This ball, intercepted by Tommy Myers at the 30. Brings it back to midfield, to the 45, gets a block from the 22 yard line, face mask on the tackle, and there was a flag before that. Well, now look at tempers. We got a ruckus going down here, Tim. And we also have an injury. Leonard Harris was running a post pattern, and Craig Penrose threw the ball wide, and no receiver was near the ball. Steve Rogers, the tackle is down on the field. He is injured. For the Denver goal. Time has elapsed. There is no time left on the clock. Apparently there was a face mask penalty along the way. There was. We, we saw that when it happened. So you can see Watch Tommy, it right here. Tommy there Myers, and we made that call. You could see that it was obvious when Greg Fiesel, who is in the ball game now with his injured shoulder, made that play. And there now, comes a late shot right there. That's by Bob Nazolik, number 89. And there's a look at Rogers. Earlier, there was an incredible hit by Kiki Diala on Leonard Harris. I don't know if you saw that. Face mask penalty by the defense on the run back. There will be one untimed down. So the half can't end on a penalty, and with no time left on the clock, Houston will have one play. So bring on Tony Fritch, and Fritch will try the field goal. It'll be a 44-yard attempt, depending on where they put that tee. His longest is 42 yards. He is 14 of 16 in field goals. He is perfect from outside the 40. Three for three from this distance. Good snap, the hold, the kick. It's long enough and it's good. Tony Fritz puts the Gamblers on the board again. That's his longest kick of the year. So, as the half comes to an end, that 43-yarder gives Houston the lead. We'll be back after this word from our local stations and a commercial message. I'm Jim Lampley again in New York. Before we continue our coverage of the United States Football League, we wanted to wrap up one remaining piece of unfinished business from our telecast a week ago of the Indianapolis 500 automobile race. Millions of you saw the horrifying crash which sent driver Patrick Bedard and his automobile into the infield, demolishing the car, but remarkably sparing Bedard's life. Pat Bedard has spent the last week in Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, recovering from the brain concussion and the broken jaw he did suffer in the accident. Kevin Madden of our Indianapolis affiliate WRTV visited him there Friday and asked him how he feels. They say there's some temporary brain damage. There's a little bit of tearing of the brain, but they expect that to heal within 90 days, something like that. Uh, there was a fracture of the lower jaw in two places that's held together with rubber bands now uh, and apart from that there was just some minor wrenching and, and jamming of the delicate machinery here 
my neck hurts, in other words. Bedard says he has no memory of the accident, nor has he seen it on videotape. If he's watching now, our understanding is this will be his first look at his momentary flirtation with destiny. I did see a few photographs in the newspaper. All it was was my helmet surrounded by flying trash. And uh, it's so unreal to me that it looks like just some Mark 1B racing footage, you know, staged for the, for the cameras. Doesn't make any sense to me. This experience is, of course, an accepted part of auto racing, but no driver knows for certain how he will respond to it. The question for Bedard, does he want to race again at Indianapolis? Yeah, I definitely want to do that. Uh, the Indianapolis 500 and other races in the championship car series are events that really capture my heart. Somehow, as an American, uh, they represent the highest racing that American has to offer. And to do that and do it well would be as important a thing as I could do in the racing field. Of course, I have another life, too. I can continue to write, do other projects, but nothing quite occupies the, the special territory in the heart that racing does. It's, it's a place where you let the animal run loose, and uh, nothing else replaces it. Several years ago, a promising young driver named Sam Posey decided after tasting the unique mixture of speed and danger at Indianapolis that he didn't need to go back and race there again. In my mind, that courageous decision helped to establish Sam Posey as an even better man than he is an automobile racer. Now it should be pointed out that Sam is among the many who vigorously support Patrick Bedard's right to go back and risk his life again at Indianapolis. The bottom line is this. Automobile racers are a different breed. They make this choice on their own. The rest of us can only pray that each one will make the decision which is best in the long run for him. We'll have more United States Football League right after this. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley again in our New York studio. Quickly now, let's get those of you who are watching Houston and Denver up to date on what's happening in the other three games today in the United States Football League. Down in Birmingham, it is surprisingly the Arizona Wranglers who are controlling the ball on the ground rather than the Birmingham Stallions. They have just entered the third period. Arizona's on top in the ball game 17-7. Here's how they got there. In the first quarter, Cliff Stout put Birmingham on top on this eight-yard touchdown pass to Ken Toller set up by a Ricky Ray interception. But moments later, Arizona came back. 81-yard touchdown run by the big man, Tim Spencer. Look at Spencer, despite his size, outrun Chuck Clanton, the outstanding Birmingham defensive back, and get into the end zone. That tied the ball game at 7-7. They went to the second quarter that way. There was a corral field goal that made it 10-7 Arizona. And despite the fact that the Wranglers have badly hurt themselves with penalties, losing one touchdown, they are controlling the game. They got another touchdown on this Landry to Larry Douglas 25-yarder. And it's 17-7 Arizona now as they have gone into the third period. In Washington, the Federals are poised for a possible big upset of the Los Angeles Express. I look to my left on the monitor. It looks as though the Express may just have scored. But before they did, it was 21-10 Washington after Washington had taken a 14-10 halftime lead. Here's how that transpired. First quarter, Mike Hohenzee threw to Greg Taylor from 10 yards out. That made it 7-0 Washington early in the ballgame. But the Express was able to come back with a play that is rapidly becoming one of their trademarks. Steve Young on the bootleg going to his left, naked, six-yard touchdown run. 7-7, the Express had tied it up. They went to the second quarter that way, but in the second quarter, the Federals took control. Hohenzee to Joey Walters on a fourth and two play after an L.A. offside on a field goal attempt. It was 14-7 Washington as Zayas field goal narrowed it to 14-10. And then in the third quarter, Young threw an interception to set up a Bledsoe one-yard touchdown run. That made it 21-10, and we are still showing 21-10, although the Express have just scored a touchdown and a two-point conversion I can see on the scoreboard on my monitor. So now make it 21-18 in favor of the Federals over the Los Angeles Express. New Jersey and Tampa Bay, Herschel Walker is being controlled. John Reeves is not. As a result, at halftime, Tampa Bay leads New Jersey 21-7 in what will be a big win for Tampa Bay in their bid for playoff berth in the Eastern Conference. Reeves, 10 of 17 for 177 yards and two touchdowns. Walker, 13 carries for 40 yards. That's what's happening elsewhere. We'll be taking you back to your ball game in the second half immediately after this. We are at halftime at Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado, where Houston leads Denver 20 to 7. 
The United States Football League is an exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. Today's game is being sponsored by Ford and your local Ford dealer who in space, where do they go? That's the term, space, and they go right up the middle. This was a third and one situation. It appeared momentarily that Fowler was stopped at the line of scrimmage. Scrimmage Gherkin, number 50, the linebacker, is in hot pursuit. But it's Nate Miller, the cornerback, number 23, who ultimately drags him down from behind. Then Denver got on the board, and what they did is they put Harry Sidney on the wing. You can see him right there, number 24, and he split the zone. He's in the slot right there. It's a play-action fake to Vinny White, number 44, a semi-roll to the right. And he gets right in between Eason, number 34, and Myers, number 37, to split the seam. And, of course, Ricky Sanders, when you talk about the guys that make the records happen for the Houston Gamblers, it's got to be Johnson and Sanders, and he does it here on the post. Sanders had a big first half, seven catches for 84 yards and one touchdown. Sprint to the right, and a post pattern there. He beats Tom Sullivan, number 32, 18-yard TD reception. So the Houston Gamblers have countered with some very fine offensive thoughts. They came out when uh, everybody went to the 5-6 defense. They ran the football. Then when they came up and loaded up front, then they went to the pass. And there are the results. Houston leads 20-7. to We'll be back for the second half kickoff right after these messages. The run-and-shoot offense of the Houston Gamblers has lit up the scoreboard in the first half. They now lead Denver 20-7. And they have outscored their opponents 132 points to 45 in the last four games. Jim Kelly, of course, has been the story. The run-and-shoot offense is not an easy one. It's been very difficult to, to read. It is a read-type thing. I talked with Houston coach Jack Pardee yesterday, and I asked Jack, how much better can this kid get, Jim Kelly? Well, I think Jim will get better every week out, every year out that he plays. He's got the ability. He's got certainly a major league arm you're looking for. I think the key ingredient Jim has to make him a great one is the desire to be the best. He's a quarterback with the arm. He likes to throw every day. Uh, of course, we signed Jim just about a year ago now. It would be about a month from now. And Jim came in and started working. So he's throwing nearly every day for a year. I mean, with very few days off. So his arm's in good shape. He loves to throw the football. He studies film, studies the opponent, and wants to be good. And when you combine that with talent, uh, that's the reason he's progressed the way he has. Right now, he is 14 of 23, 134 yards and one touchdown. You saw the graphic on the screen. One more touchdown will tie the all-time record for most touchdowns in a game. That was set back in 1961 by George Blanda and tied in 1963 by Y.A. Tittle. Two touchdowns will give that young man the record. You know, when you go back to 1982, which was the year of the quarterback in college football, the top three, as we look at Clarence Verdan, who had a 94-yard return last week, the top three quarterbacks that year were Kelly, Elway, and Marino coming into the season. Of course, Kelly went down with a shoulder injury, and a lot of people forgot about him. But that was probably the greatest year for quarterbacks in NCAA history, and Kelly was one of the top three. Brian Spielman's kick takes Verdan one yard deep into the end zone. Verdan with 4-2-8 speed. Gives a limp leg, a jitterbug, picks up a block, but still goes out of bounds at the 8-yard line. So, just like in the first half, Houston will start with poor field position. Mouse Davis, the offensive coordinator right there. And Jim Kelly's your quarterback. The rest of the offense will be pretty much as it was in the beginning of the ball game. Todd Fowler will be your running back. Slot back is Richard Johnson. Ricky Sanders will be another slot back. The wideouts, Gerald McNeil and Greg Moser. The offensive line, Rodgers, Boucher, Khalil, Kidd, and Robinson. A line that averages 257 pounds. First down from the nine. We're just underway, second half. Mile High Stadium. Tim Brandt, Lee Gross Cup. The Gamblers lead it 20 to 7. This is Fowler. Not much there. John Bungart's the linebacker. Filled the hole quickly. Well, let's move him back even farther this time because now the Gamblers are called for holding on that play. And looking at the halftime numbers, Tim, you can see how Houston took charge in the second quarter. Time of possession, even though they're a big play team, they've kept the ball 18 minutes, 59 seconds. 
And in total yards now, they lead Denver 261 okay. to 86. Holding number 73, penalties declined, second down. Turnovers you mentioned you thought would be a factor. None for the gamblers, one for the gold. Number 73 guilty of that penalty is Ernie Rogers. On the defense, Bill Matthews injured his knee, tore a ligament in the first half, linebacker for Denver. Bruce Huther, just recently acquired from Pittsburgh, is taking his place. Run and shoot, sprint out, three-step drop. Alvin Turner, another sack. And that has been the problem for the Houston Gamblers offensively all season. 68 times they've been sacked this year. The league record, of course, set last year by the Oakland Invaders, 71 on quarterback Fred Bassana. One of the problems in the run and shoot, Tim, as you look at it here, is backside pressure. Number 99, Calvin Turner, the most consistent down lineman for the goal last year, is the man who gets to Jim Kelly. So, poor punt return, a holding penalty, and now a sack moves him back to the five-yard line. It is third and 14. The lone setback is Fowler, and he's the ball carrier. And he's not going to get the first on this one. Big Mike Paul, 270-pounder out of Colorado State, collared him. Tremendous emotional energy in the stadium here today. You mentioned that a lot of people showed up early to watch the Alabama concert. They have stayed, and they're seeing a very physical football game. And you're looking at a very emotional number 71, Mike Call, out of Colorado State. Well, that's what they need right now. They need a leader, somebody to fire them up. And right now it's 71. Dale Walters is on to do the duty as the punter, and David Martin is the deep man. Martin, as you may remember, is all pro in the USFL as their return man. This kick will go out of bounds inside the 40-yard line. We'll see where they mark it. Good pressure backside, Kelvin Newton. And Walters just did not hit the football nicely. Well, they finally mark it on the 41. 32-yard punt. Denver has the ball. Tim, we talked earlier about the intimidation factor. Watch the shot that Daryl Hemphill puts on Richard Johnson, number 22, right here. Just as he passes by, as he's slipping into coverage, puts a little shot on him. As you like to say, lets him know he's in the neighborhood. Sure, and it puts the receiver's head on a swivel. Next time he comes out there, he's going to be looking to see where Hemp Hill is. Good field position for the Denver Gold from the 41. Just underway the second half. First possession for the Gold. Craig Penrose is the quarterback. Play action. Going deep. He's going for Leonard Harris. Intercepted in the end zone by Will Lewis. His sixth interception of the year, and he's going to run it back one hellacious block inside the five and takes it out to the 14 yard line Calvin Eason was the man that just leveled one of the Denver goal well an A for effort going for the touchdown in a hurry but then the execution was not the best sometimes when you have good field position it's good to go for your big play on first down that's what Penrose does He's aiming for Harris. The ball is intercepted by Lewis, number 24. Now, I don't know if he was wise to run this out of the end zone or not, Tim, but he does bring it out. There's a tremendous block there on Calvin Eason, number 30. Or Eason delivers the block right there. Will Lewis was acquired from Denver, played here last year, played with both the Seahawks and the Chiefs in the NFL, but he was a steal. Leads the Gamblers with six interceptions now from the 13-yard line. This is Todd Fowler, and there's not much there. So the defense continues to rise to the challenge. I think the Denver defense has done quite well today, but they've been on the field most of the day. Giveaway-takeaway ratio for Houston is minus five, so that'll help them in that category. In their time of possession, they average 30 minutes a game. Denver is right at zero in that category. Giveaway-takeaway. Denver averages 30 minutes a game as well on time of possession. I don't think they've had that this game. No, absolutely not. Second and eight. Backside pressure and he goes down. The ball's loose. No, they say he was down. They say the gamblers maintain the football. It was David Dumars who came on a safety blitz. 
again, there's a controversial call, and you can hear the reaction of the crowd. Safety blitz right here. Now watch the work of David Dumars, number 21, and Kelly is starting to throw there. I don't know. Again, it's a very controversial call, and I think Denver may have gotten the poor end of that one, Tim. Well, it gives him third down and eight. It was Bruce Huther who recovered it for Denver. They nullify that, and from the 15, Kelly will go back to work. Sprint out option. The pitch back on the option to Fowler. Well, I hate to call how close he is to a first down after the controversial first down marking in the first half. Denver says they're short of it. Todd Fowler, the running hero of the first half, you see right there. Very rarely do you see the option play like that in the professional ranks. Kelly has run it effectively, however. Draws make up most of their running attack, along with dives, counters, and traps. Occasionally, they run the option play. Kelly has scored a few times. Let's listen to this. What is Kelly's read on the option? He's reading the corner. Sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's the end. Sometimes it's the linebacker. But this goes back all the way to the split T option play in the 40s. That far. Going back now, moments ago, where Jim Kelly was sacked. Watch Dumars. Number 21. Now, was, was this a fumble or was it an incomplete pass or was it a sack? Two controversial plays today have gone against the Denver Gold. Well, that's Dale Walters, the rookie from Rice. He averages 40 yards per punt. Today, his average has dropped 35. This is Vincent White back to recover this punt, return this punt, and he takes it to the 34-yard line. Well, again, it was good pressure by Dave Preston, who made Dale Walters hurry his punt. Score remains the same, 20 to 7. Baseball returns to prime time with the season premiere of ABC's Monday Night Baseball. A couple of good ones for you, Toronto versus Detroit. The Tigers lost to Baltimore again today. Toronto was losing to the Yankees, so that should be a good matchup. Cincinnati and Los Angeles. Jim Palmer has joined the ABC Sports Crew full-time. Here in Denver, from the 35 on first and 10, Vincent White pulls his way out to the 40-yard line. And that's the kind of play, Lee Gross Cup, they need on first downs. I think this is going to be an important offensive series right now for the goal. Isolated look at the offensive line of Denver. You mentioned, Tim, that they've been beat up. But they've got a good surge right here. Excellent surge right here, particularly George Yarno, probably the most consistent player. He's number 66. Steve Rogers, number 74 out of BYU, leading the way for Benny White. There's a flag on the play as you watch the defense around the football. The offensive line is a big one. That time they did not get much much pressure on that gambler defense. The offensive lineup for you, or the defensive lineup for you, of course remains pretty much the same with Cleveland Crosby, Tony Fitzpatrick, Hosea Taylor, and Pete Caton up front. They're going against that big offensive line of Denver. Matt Miller, Greg Fiesel, Tom Davis, George Yarno, and Steve Rogers. Fred Mortensen was the quarterback who started today. Penrose has gone most of the afternoon. Harry Sidney, Vincent White are the setbacks. Leonard Harris and Elmer Bailey are Denver's wideouts. Here's the call on the penalty. Personal foul. Offense. Illegal block below the way. Number 24. Second down. That's Harry Sidney. Number 24. The illegal block. Come on, you guys. Get around it. So it'll bring up second and 18 from the 27. Denver in desperate need of some offensive generation here. 
Penrose, backside pressure, sets up the screen, and he has Vincent White. Vincent White gets a block to the 30, the 35, runs into some opposition at the 37-yard line and gets up near the 40, but there's another flag. Yeah, Vincent White, 5 foot 8, 200 pounds. I think Harry Sidney's going to get called again for an illegal block, Tim. Denver's killing themselves. It's unfortunate the screen was well developed. Offensive pass interference, number 87. Loss of down. Victor Hicks. Third down. So it's not Harry Sidney, it's Victor Hicks, the tight end out of Oklahoma, who is called for the infraction. Denver is 8-5 and five on the season, holding on to a slim one-game lead over the LA Express. Los Angeles is playing in Washington today, and the Express have all they can handle there. Penrose drops deep, looks long, overthrown, almost intercepted. Denver has had problems on their possession, as this graphic clearly illustrates right there, Tim. You can see where the drives have started and where they have what has resulted from them. Mostly punts. Only one touchdown in there. And you know, they have had pretty good field position. Outstanding field position. Gerald McNeil, you look at him, he's had one punt return today. McNeil. He's had a 60-yard return this year, but this punt drives him all the way back to the 20. It rolls to the 13, to the 12 and a half yard line. So Brian Spielman gets off a rocket. And again, it backs up Houston. And again, the Denver defense will be called upon to stop the run and shoot. The Denver defense started out today with five linebackers, six defensive backs. They went to five defensive backs. They've tried everything, and it has not been able to stop the gamblers that often. Jerry Argovitz, who you see right there, uh, may be... Uh, uh, what is he going to do? Is he going to crawl the length of the field if Houston uh, doesn't score 24 points? Well, Jim Carr, the defensive coordinator for Denver, said that the key was 24 points. He said if they could hold Houston to 24 points, that they would win the game. Jerry Argovitz says no one can hold this team to 24 points, and he would be willing to crawl the length of the field if Denver could do it. 3-4 linemen for the Denver Gold. They drop their linebackers now. They show a man defense for Jim Kelly. First down from the 11. Kelly under pressure has room to run. And slides down at the 22-yard line. Well, Jim Kelly has said outwardly that he does not like to run the football. However, his statistics are pretty good. Ran for a touchdown last week. Well, you look at his all-purpose numbers right there. You see that he has rushed for 370 yards. And... Uh, we mentioned this earlier. He's a big physical guy, 6'3", 215, and was recruited by Joe Paterno at Penn State as a linebacker. Jim Kelly was born in Pittsburgh, started playing football at the age of eight, competed in the local punt, pass, and kick competition, and advanced to the semifinals in San Diego. So Lee Gross Cup, he was a natural gifted athlete even as a youngster. Well, first down, he throws, and it's complete to Ricky Sanders. Tommy Myers right now is downstairs with our colleague Jim Bergamo. Jimmy? All right, thank you, Tim. Tommy, uh, the, the Denver offense is having an extreme amount of trouble right now moving. What's the problem, and what are you doing to stop them? Well, I think we've, we're dropping back and uh, getting some good, playing some real good zones and mixing it up with some tight man-to-man -man coverage. I think we got them a little confused on the coverage we're running. We're getting some good pressure. I think we're trying to keep everything in front of us in, uh, in order not to let the big play go. All right, I'm sure your leadership has helped too since coming to the team. Back to you, Tim. Greg Moser comes to the bottom of the screen. A whole host of receivers go to the top. Sanders, Johnson, and Gerald McNeil. That's where Kelly wants to throw. Now he looks back to Moser. He's in trouble. Rolls past it. And he gets the first down. So Jim Kelly scrambles outside of containment and picks up a Houston first. 
We were isolated on number 57, John Bungarts out of Cal State Fullerton. Watch his reaction to Kelly. He takes his drop into the coverage first, sees that Kelly is scrambling, and then pursues and runs Kelly out along the sidelines. Kelly now has three carries, 21 yards. Scott McGee to the bottom. Richard Johnson, Sanders, and Harris to the top. A little dump pass to Fowler underneath, and there's not a whole lot there. Kelvin Newton fills quickly, and he wasn't fooled at all. So, that'll still bring up a long situation for the gamblers and Jim Kelly. Let's go to Jim Lampley now. So much of what happens to Denver depends on other teams, and while L.A. has rallied to tie in Washington, Arizona has now slipped behind in Birmingham. After a Leon Carey touchdown run earlier in the quarter, now this stout to Jim Smith, 21-yard pass. Birmingham leads 21-17. Cribs is heating up. It doesn't look good for Arizona. And let's go back out to Mile High Stadium. And Jim Lampley, as you well know, the rumor in Arizona, of course, is that George Allen's job could be in jeopardy. And there's a lot of talk about Frank Cush. Sanders in motion, eight minutes, 30 seconds remain in this quarter, the third, and flags fly before Kelly can do anything. Bruce Huther, number 59, was coming quickly. And they're going to move Houston back even farther. Ball start, offense number 73, second down. Tampa Bay leads New Jersey 28-7. John Reeves is hot there. Herschel Walker having a tough time there. Los Angeles and the Washington Federals now tied 21-21, as Lamps just told us in New York. And Arizona in a dogfight with Birmingham. That cheer we just heard was for the Sun. Second and 15 for Kelly. He's under pressure and he's going to go down. And again there's a flag and it's going to be holding again on the Houston Gamblers. Calvin Turner, big number 99 for Denver, gets the sack. So make it 69 sacks as Houston approaches the record of 71. Offense number 73, the penalty was declined, third down. Backside pressure we talked about as one of the keys in the run and shoot. Again, it's Turner, number 99, closing in on Kelly. There was a holding call on Rogers, the offensive tackle, number 73. David Stalls, number 77, the defensive end for Denver, was in the neighborhood. He's retiring at the end of this year to go back to school at Colorado State to become a veterinarian, despite a lucrative offer by the Raiders. Third and 24, Kelly going deep, has a man. It's McNeil, and McNeil, well, they rule it incomplete. I thought he had the football. It hit the ground, but a great effort by Gerald McNeil and a fine throw by Jim Kelly. So Houston's going to have to turn the ball over. I think the ball bounced when he bounced. Gerald McNeil, the All-American out of Baylor, number 13, running a straight fly pattern. Great pass by Kelly. Leaping catch right there. Now you see the ball hit the ground right there before he recovers it. I think that's a great call. Terrific effort, though. The deep man is Vincent White again for Denver. The kicker is Dale Walters. punt. Vincent White sidesteps the lead there. Now he looks for help and gets back to the 40-yard line. So, he was cornered in. Vincent White did a little shake, rattle, and roll, but could only pick up an extra yard after a 48-yard punt by Walters. This program is being brought to you as an exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. Now let's pause five seconds to allow our local stations to identify themselves. KGO TV Channel 7, San Francisco. 
Eight minutes remaining in the third quarter from Mile High Stadium. Tim Brandt, Lee Gross Cup. From the 41-yard line, Greg Penrose has first down. High formation. The up back, Harry Sidney. The ball carrier, Vincent White, has a big hole into the secondary. Close to a first down. He'll be a yard shy, but he's up at midfield and into Houston territory. Good second effort there by Vincent White out of Stanford. He's the man who replaced Darren Nelson at Stanford. And like Darren, he's a good all-purpose player, equally effective as a runner and as a pass receiver. He, he set a single-game record last year against uh, Arizona when he got 159 yards. Vincent was originally drafted out of Stanford by the Jets. That's Harry Sidney there trying for the first down. These ladies are known as Pure Gold, a collection of cheerleaders that we have seen several times this year. Outstanding group of young ladies. They're led by a lady named Miss Twirl, who is a former Miss Colorado. Glad to see you, see you read your scouting report. You were out here yesterday, composing oh, that scouting report. Always. Two tight ends, a wing back. Two setbacks on third and one. It's straight ahead, first down, Denver. Good surge there by Vinnie White, number 44. The offensive line going to work. You talked about how they were beat up. Bo Matthews out of Colorado, number 41, had the lead block. You know, White is tied in the Stanford record books with Tony Hill with 18 career touchdowns. I'm going to correct myself. Bo Matthews was the ball carrier. He's number 41. These 40s get a little confusing. On the 46 on first down, Penrose wants to throw, and it's knocked down at the line of scrimmage. Lloyd Lewis got a big bear paw on it, and the pass didn't have a chance. Lloyd Lewis, number 68, got his right bear paw up, I think. Look at the body on him. 6'3", 250. He's out of Texas A&I. Pocket pass right here. No, it's his left hand that he gets up. Good effort there. He's a javelina out of Texas A&I. Second and ten. Penrose with time. Drops it across the middle and White can't hold on. The pass was intended for Vincent White. I think he lost the ball slightly when Hollis Hall ran in front of him. Broke his concentration and he couldn't regain his composure and make the catch. It'll bring up third and ten. Vincent White is just at the bottom of your screen there, circling out of the backfield. Penrose looks right first, comes back to the left, over the middle there. Hollis Hall, number 25, just kind of swung his hand in front of the ball and it broke Vinny's concentration. Penrose 0-5 this half. He goes to the shotgun to see if he can get more time and better accuracy. This ball is knocked down nicely by Will Lewis. I think Will Lewis could play cornerback anywhere, anytime, for any team. But he particularly likes working here today because he was a member of this Denver Gold team, as you mentioned. The tail end of the play, watch the perfect timing by Will Lewis as he sticks his left hand in there and bats the ball away. You know, he started last year for the gold until he was injured and then beaten out for the job by Nate Miller. Ryan Spielman comes on to punt. Last time he was up, he had a 71-yard punt. Look out. He's in trouble. Throws a pass. Intercepted. And a flag is dropped. Mike Mitchell, number 35, makes the interception. And things are just starting to fall apart now for the Denver goal. Well, with the sun, the crowd seemed to come back. Mile High's filling up again. George Arno is the long snapper on the punts. And Brian Spielman never got a handle on it. We 
Well, they'll move the play back against the Denver Gold. Houston comes out. An eligible man downfield offense on fourth down. It's lost it down. It will be a first down. So things just get worse for the Denver Gold. 5.27 left in the third quarter. It starts with a snap from center George Yarno. It's a little short. Tries to get it on the first hop, does Brian Spielman. Now he should never throw this ball. It's intercepted by the cornerback, Mitchell, number 35. Kelly going long. He's got a man. It's Richard Johnson down at the 20-yard line. So they went two slots, two wideouts, post pattern, and Kelly put it on the numbers. Johnson beats Steve Trimble. Richard Johnson, who we spotlighted at the top of our show, telling you he was a former running back, played here for the goal last year. Starts outside, then comes back inside. That's his second read. Steve Trimble, number 47, on the coverage. We mentioned that the run and shoot, simply put, is a total read on the run, both by the quarterbacks and by the receivers. There are two slot backs, there's a single back, there is motion on most every play, and there is a sprint out action, most of the time, by the quarterback. Straight ahead is Fowler. Richard Johnson, by the way, now has four catches, 48 yards, and he has at least three catches in every single game this year. An astounding mark. He has 97 on the year. Come on, D! Two 1,000-yard receivers. As we look at the former 18-year NFL veteran, Craig Morton. Cowboys, on, Giants, D. Broncos. He liked a lot of the things about the NFL. There are a lot of things he didn't like. He tried to incorporate that into his coaching philosophy and has been mostly successful. Denver doesn't hide its defensive scheme. This time they show man defense all the way, and I'm telling you, tempers are flaring now, and flags are flying. Looks like flag day here at Mile High. Ball start, offense number 70. So Robinson jumps, and Bungarts and Todd Fowler got into it. Started throwing some fists, no penalty on that. That'd be a pretty good little Dunnebrook. John Bungarts is 220, Fowler's 220. Both are 6'3 and a half, 6'4. I can tell you want to get these guys scratching and clawing, don't you? Need to pick up the pace a little bit here. It's second and 11 from the 22. Kelly wants to put another touchdown on the board. He's not going to get it this time, or will he? He scrambles out. No, the whistle had blown. He was in the grasp of the defensive man, and they called the whistle. So they'll mark it there and give him another sack. Calvin Turner was the man that came in and had Kelly in his grasp. It's the third sack of the afternoon. Calvin Turner, who has been effective on Jim Kelly, they pressures him. He's tackled downfield. They whistled it dead, however. And that ruling is for the benefit of the quarterback. A lot of people don't like it. They don't like the quick whistle. But ultimately, it saves quarterbacks. Let's watch the pressure right now. Fourth sack of, on the day for Kelly. Here comes the, the penetration. There's Calvin Turner. Kelly appears to get away, but they whistled him dead. Third sack for Turner this afternoon. Kelly again with time. Rolls right at the line of scrimmage. He'll go down there. Big Dave Stalls takes him down and then talks to him. Well, Dave Stalls, who wants to become a veterinarian, is going to go back to school in the offseason, despite a lucrative offer by the Raiders has had an outstanding pro football career. He left the team proclaiming burnout at one point during the year, he missed a game, wanted to rethink the season, rethink his life. What about announcers burnout? <laughs> I think we should make the point here that uh, one of the weaknesses in that run and shoot offense is the fact that the... Other than that, it's all right. We'll be back. So the point we 
were going to make before the commercial break was that Houston has now been sacked 71 times. The weakness has been the offensive line. And, of course, the record in the USFL was 71 sacks set by Bassana, Fred Bassana, in Oakland last year. Tony Fritch is on to attempt this field goal. It is for his 12th consecutive field goal. A 48-yard attempt. It is good. So Tony Fritch has now hit 12 straight field goals. That one they mark now officially at 49 yards. That ties Mazzetti's record in the United States Football League. Lee Gross Cup. There's a happy man right there. We've talked about the Tony Fritch story. Look at this guy. I mentioned earlier he looks like he could be a chef. 16 years in the NFL. Watch him come through the ball right now. Head down. Swing through. Keep your eye on the ball. He wants it. <laughs> he peaked a little early, but he hit it good. He's having quite a day. Well, that's his longest field goal of the year. 12 straight. And again, I tell you, it ties Tim Mazzetti's record of the New Orleans Breakers. And he's out of Noni College. Explain, Tim. Seven field goals in two weeks. It's amazing. College none, sometimes known as Noni College, to announcers who scan the roster too quickly. <laughs> He's a card. He was, we enjoyed chatting with him yesterday. He says he can kick as well as anybody still. He told me he'd kicked in every major stadium in the world, counting his soccer experience. Five foot seven, 200 pounds. He, he really enjoys life. Low kickoff here. It is muffed and now picked up by the up back, and they will return it. Dave Preston gets a hold across the 40 to the 41 yard line. Dave Preston, fine return. Preston, of course, caught the touchdown pass that allowed Denver to win last week. Seven-year player out of Bowling Green, a 32-yard touchdown reception last year, now referred to by Craig Morton as the miracle. That gave them a 27-20 win over San Antonio. As we look at another one of the pure gold cheerleaders. 23-7. Denver trails, they need some offense. Fred Mortensen is the quarterback. He's the one that started the game. He now replaces Craig Penrose as White goes in motion. This is Sidney, and Sidney is tripped up in the backfield by Tony Fitzpatrick. One thing Fred Mortensen gives them, Tim, is a little more mobility. And at this point in the game, they may need a scrambling quarterback. This is not the way to start a drive. Good effort right there, defensively by Cleveland Crosby and no it's Tony Fitzpatrick out of the University of Miami he was called the rock of Miami's defense by Howard Schnellenberger very effective in uh, the ball game against Nebraska there is an injury and it is Cleveland Crosby big defensive end 6'5 250 pounder out of University of Arizona Coming up next Saturday, the Professional Bowlers Spring Tour continues. That'll be live from Riverside, California with Chris Schenkel. United States Olympic Trials in the boxing. Golden Glove champion welterweight Mark Breland and super heavyweight Tyrell Biggs are the stars in that one. There will be others competing as well in ABC's Wide World of Sports. U.S. Outdoor Track and Field Championships live from San Jose, California. Also the Grand Prix of Monaco as we get closer to the Olympics. Greg Mortensen, two, 300-yard games in the last three weeks. Started this game, was pulled, and now he comes back in in an effort to rally the goal. Second and 12, across the middle, and he bounces it in the direction of number 80, Leonard Harris. Boo birds are out. Mortensen now 0 for 3. Craig Penrose left the game, 5 of 17 for only 61 yards. He had missed his last eight passes and went 0 for 6 in the second half. That's Craig Penrose I'm talking about. He's not the only one that's left the game. The crowd has thinned out quite a bit. Disenchantment on the part of this crowd that originally was very enthusiastic. It started with that Alabama concert. Boy, they had him rocking. Nizola comes out. Leonard Harris comes out along with Harry Sidney. They go to shotgun formation. Kevin Williams comes in. Along with David Preston. Third and 12. Mortensen in trouble and he goes down. Tony Fitzpatrick gets the sack. Go, 
Tony Fitzpatrick, number 62, who we talked about earlier, he was a nose tackle when they had the three-man look. Now he's a defensive tackle. He's the man pressuring Mortensen right there. Does a good job of lassoing him his legs and then bringing him down. Rugged guy. Brian Spielman, number three, will punt it to the deep back, Gerald McNeil, number 13 for Houston. Last time, Denver didn't get the punt off. It was a bad snap. This time, McNeil will field it on the 34. Looks for his wall, finds the funnel, tries to get outside, gets his block and turns the corner to the 47-yard line. Gerald McNeil. Well, one man in this stadium I know is ecstatic right now, and that's Jerry Argovitz, who's standing by with Jim Bergamo. Jerry, uh, the president of the Houston Gamblers. Uh, Jerry, uh, before the game, Denver's defensive coach, Jim Carr, said that he was going to hold your team to 24 points, and you said what? <laughs> well, I told him we had two halves to play, and if, if he held our, our, game, our team to 24 points, that I'd crawl, crawl across the field after the game was over and shake his hand on the 50-yard line. And I don't, I don't believe he's going to make it. You've got 23 points right now. You still have to make 24, but obviously you've got to be impressed with the way your team's playing today. Our team's a little flat, uh, actually, today, uh, compared to the way we normally play. Uh, started a little flat, but we're coming along. I'm really proud of our defense, but the offense is going to be there. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Well, one more point. You won't have to worry about crawling across. First down for Jim Kelly. Johnson in motion. The give inside is Sanders, and Sanders picks up three yards. Ricky Sanders in the role of a running back, and he was that at Southwest Texas State. You see him coming from the slot back. We saw him do this one time earlier underneath ball handling. Gets a pretty good opening on the left side and picks up about four yards. MVP in the 1982 Palm Bowl, which was the Division II championship. Southwest Texas State beating UC Davis in that game. Also a fine track athlete. Competed in the pole vault, the hurdles, the long jump. State champion in high school. Second down and six for Houston. With time, pump fakes, reloads, and now throws to Richard Johnson. He'll be shy of the first down. There's a late hit and a flag. David Dumars was just leveled. But it was after the whistle, so the flags did come out. Looked like Scott Butcher who came in there. And they'll mark it back, move, move Houston back, and they'll take away what was a fine play. Johnson on the tail end of the play making the catch here over the middle. Number 50 is Greg Gherkin. Collars him right there. And there's the late hit. Is it Boucher? We'll wait for the play. We'll know. Personal foul, unnecessary roughness, number 60 on the offense, a continuing action foul, second down. So it'll be second down and long, and it was against Boucher, and you see him there in the huddle. Johnson now has five catches for 53 yards after a slow start. Even when these guys are bad, they are good, Tim. Kelly, for example, had his worst game and still got about 230 yards passing. Second down and long, little six, slip screen to Fowler. Fowler breaks the tackle, gets across midfield. He'll be four yards shy of the first. David Stalls tracks him down there. Pretty good battles going on around the rest of the league today. Look at this. The Express have now exploded 35-21 over the Federals. It seems like we just gave that score and it was tied at 21 all. It was. And the Wranglers lead the Birmingham Stallions, 31-21. I think that's a bit of an upset. Arizona has yet to win two games in a row. However, when they play well, they are as good as anyone in the league. We saw them early in the year, and they were playing very aggressive football then. So things are really heating up in the Pacific Division. We said at the top of the year, we thought the Pacific Division was going to be one of the strongest. Well, you heard the gun as the third quarter comes to an end. The United States Football League, Houston Gamblers, and Denver Gold will continue after this message and a word from our local stations with a score 23 to 7. As we start the final quarter, Houston leads 23 to 7 over Denver. 
The United States Football League is an exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. Today's game is being sponsored by Chevrolet. With the performance, the style, the innovation, the quality and the value that make up today's Chevrolet. And by Federal Express. Well, Denver head coach Craig Morton said he needed five turnovers and a big crowd. They haven't gotten the turnovers. They did get the big crowd. 50,000, 57 at Mile High Stadium today. Third and three for Jim Kelly and the Gamblers. From the 46, the pitch back to Fowler. Breaks the tackle to the 30, the 20, the 10, five. Touchdown, Houston. Like a runaway locomotive, once he turned the corner, there was no stopping him. And for a man who was not an option quarterback in college, Jim Kelly gives a very fast read right here. He read the corner. Tom Sullivan was up fast. He gets around there. Now, in the secondary, Nate Miller, number 23, has turned around. He didn't even see Fowler coming. He was looking in the other direction for about 10 or 15 yards, Tim. And had he turned around, he would have had a good shot at Fowler. But he was looking the other way. A 46-yard run. Fowler on the day, 19 carries, 190 yards. Could break the record of 200 yards held by his teammate, Sam Harrell. That gave that in a game earlier against Chicago. Tony Fritz for the extra point. Fritz is also having a fine afternoon. This one's Locked. blocked. This one's blocked by, well, it looks like Mike Call. He's the most excited of the bunch. Mike Call, big number 71, has been an inspirational leader all afternoon on a day when Denver has needed some inspiration. Watch Mike Call, number 71, come into your picture. He's out of Colorado State. One year of professional experience, and as you mentioned, an inspirational leader today. He, oh, looky there. That's perfect. That's a clinic for blocking a... Uh, a PAT. Only the second miss of an extra point for Tony Fritz this year. Well, not much you can do about that one. So goodbye to the 24 point concept. 29 to 7 right now. Fred Mortensen's got to get these guys fired up. The whole game plan, of course, changes now, Tim. Because Denver completely in the posture of playing catch-up football. That's not their game. Craig Morton indicated yesterday that the key would be possession football. He wanted to keep Houston off the field. They have been unable to do that. Houston has been impressive all year, and they just continue to get stronger. Nine and five record. Four of their losses have been by three points or less, and three of those were in overtime. Another short kick. Harry Sidney fumbles around with it, finally picks it up at the 20. And that's exactly where he's going to go down. Let's go downstairs. Here's Jim Bergamo. Okay, Todd, that was the second time you ran the option. This time a lot more effective. What was the difference? Oh, well, we had a pass called. Jim uh, called him, shifted over, and he checked the option. And uh, we had lined in a great job. Jim pitched at the right time. Gerald McNeil here, he run, he run a guy clean the end zone chasing him. I just had to run over him right on the goal line. You're approaching Harrell's record. Are you aware of that? Oh, well, it don't matter to me as long as we win. All right, thanks, Todd. Yeah, thank <laughs> He's got the right attitude, doesn't he? He really does. 660 yards in the last five games. You mentioned that he was a tight end all during his college career at Stephen F. Austin. Well, the Denver goal trying to get some offense now. Mortensen still the quarterback. Victor Hicks had it and dropped it. That's the story of the day. Well, we talked about possession football. Denver obviously has not been able to keep the ball long enough. Look how long Houston has had the ball. Total yards now. Look how dominating Houston is. 317 to 87. The passing yards, of course. Jim Kelly, 148 to 45. Equally dominating in the rushing department. And, of course, the five turnovers that Craig Morton said it would take to beat Houston is not quite the way it's turned out. His club has had three turnovers, and they haven't been able to force any. This pass knocked down by Hosea Taylor. And the crowd now really upset. Jim Kelly. 
You know, in high school, we played quarterback, defensive back, punted, kicked off for East Brady High School. East Brady High School, rather, and they won two straight state championships. He said his hero growing up in Pennsylvania was Terry Bradshaw. Kind of makes me think of Bradshaw at times. He has that similar size, the ability to throw deep. Denver has now thrown 12 straight incomplete passes. Wartonson is 0 for 5 in that streak. Third and 10 for Mortensen, again under pressure. Hurries the throw and it's incomplete. Kiki Diala came through and just leveled Mortensen. Kiki Diala was a defensive end when he played at Texas. Of course, you and I covered him there, Tim, in 1982 against the University of Arkansas. As a middle linebacker, he's very effective. He has the quickness you'd like, and he's very competitive. Kiki was the first player to sign with the Houston Gamblers. Denver Gold continues to try to sign some blue chip talent. Matter of fact, they are in negotiations right now for Cal's linebacker Ron Rivera, who was drafted in the second round of the National Football League draft by the Chicago Bears. Spielman gets off a high punt, long punt, drives McNeil back to the 34-yard line. And he returns it to the 44. So, a 10-yard return for Gerald McNeil. George Yarno made the tackle, a 46-yard punt, and our score is 29 to 7. So the Denver goal continues to struggle here in Mile High Stadium. It's been a strange year. They were 7 and 1, then lost 5 in a row before beating San Antonio 27 and 20 last week. So what's left? Well, teams with a combined record of 29 and 13 with Oakland having won six in a row, so it doesn't get much easier. Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Oakland left on the roster for Denver. This is Fowler again, and he just runs at will. First down, Houston. He may have a new record. That's going to be close to him. We mentioned that the record is 200 yards held by his teammate, Sam Harrell, and that's going to be very close. I think he knows he has the record. Jim Kelly just came up and shook his hand and congratulated him. So did some of the other players come up and pat his fanny. If he doesn't have it, he's awfully close. He has tied it unofficially. 20 carries for 200 yards, 10 on that last carry. Harrell had 200 yards on 20 carries against Chicago. It's 57 seconds left in the ball game. Houston and Denver. We're at Mile High Stadium, somewhere between the Kansas Plains and the Colorado Rockies. Again, it's Fowler, so if he didn't have it before, he has it now. And he rambles up close to another first down. He'll be about two yards shy. It'll be second and two. No doubt about that now. He has the USFL single game rushing record. Our congratulations to Todd Fowler, talented rookie out of Stephen F. Austin. Where, as you mentioned before, he played tight end, mostly. Switched to running back and took charge when Sam Harrell went down and has been extremely effective. Quite a story. Todd Fowler, 16th round draft pick, the 332nd player chosen. Quick pass across the middle. Moser has it at the 23 and slides to the 22. Here's Jim Bergamo again. All right, Tim, with me, Ron Rivera, the linebacker out of California, Berkeley, who was recently drafted by the Chicago Bears and also looking to sign a contract with the Denver Gold. The paper, Ron, says you're three-quarters of the way signing with the Denver Gold. What does that mean? Well, basically, it means we've got the numbers set. Now all we have to do is, you know, put all the finest, final touches, you know, all the insurance policy, the, you know, things like that just to ensure it. When will you sign, do you think? Oh, we could have something, you know, tomorrow, next week, you know, Friday. There's no telling, really, it's just whenever they get everything settled. Why Denver and not the Chicago Bears? Well, basically because of what Denver's offering me. You know, being a young athlete, I've got, you know, consider my career. And uh, that's really what Denver's going to do is ensure my career for me. Well, Thank while you Ron. listen to Ron Rivera, Scott McGee catches a touchdown pass from Jim Kelly. So Jim Kelly continues to light up the record books. And he ties the record of George Blanda and Y.A. Tittle with 36 touchdowns on the year. And it comes on Kelly's best pass of the day. Watch this, Tim, because it's picture perfect. Roll to the right. Scott McGee, one of the Mouseketeers on a post pattern. That ball could not have been thrown better. You, talk, you know the cliche, threading the needle? He did that. 
George Blanda, 36 touchdowns in 1961 with the Houston Oilers. Y.A. Tittle in 1963 with the Giants. And now, Jim Kelly, 36 touchdowns in the season with the Houston Gamblers. Tony Fritsch, his extra point is good. And we've got ourselves a good old-fashioned blowout in Denver. So, there's your score, 36-7. Jim Kelly, there he is, the record setter. Record tire, 36 in the second year of a new league. George Blanda threw 36 in the second year of a new league. That was in 1961. Y.A. Tittle, you mentioned, an old teammate of mine with the New York Giants, did it in 1963. Tony Fritsch kicks it off, and Leonard Harris won't have a shot at it. Hey, listen, you, you tie a record to me, you set the record. Let's go downstairs. Jim Kelly and Jim Bergamo. Jim, uh, what is it? Are you just really starting to click right now, or is Devon's is defense right? being a little tired? Uh, I think it's a little, a little both. Uh, we're starting to read our, uh, you know, read our coverages. Receivers are breaking routes, but the big thing is our linemen are starting doing a good job. And Scott Boucher, tell you what, if the offense line continues to do what they're doing and concentrates, and uh, I think we can do real well. But big thing is the execution. That's number one. You want to stay in there to get another touchdown? That'll give you 37 for the record. Well, I'll take it next week because my whole family's going to be there, and I told him I'd wait till next week. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say hi to my brother, Ed and Dan. Love you both. <laughs> well, while he's a happy quarterback out on the field for the Denver Gold, Ken Hobart comes in. He's the third-team quarterback out of Idaho. He's just a rookie, 6'1", 205-pounder, and we'll see what old number nine can do here now. Can try to generate some offense. Has not had much playing time this year. Denver has thrown 13 straight incomplete passes. Hobart will try to break that on this play. He throws deep, and Elmer Bailey's out there. Bailey to the 15-yard line. Ken Hobart to Elmer Bailey. So the rookie out of Idaho comes into the ball game and generates some offense. Ken Hobart, who we saw earlier this year with the Jacksonville Bulls, a great athlete, throws his first pass to Elmer Bailey, a bomb on the dead run, 67 yards, and this crowd has really lit up with the emergence now of Ken Hobart, who is the third quarterback that we have seen today. We talked about how they played musical quarterback over the last two years. In a moment, Tim, I want to amplify on that. Bailey, of course, all Big Ten at Minnesota. Clyde has traded in the NFL for three seasons with Miami and Baltimore. The pitch back is Bill Johnson, and Johnson loses the football. I believe Denver gets it back. Reeves, Johnson, Gillum, Napple, Steve Turk, Alvin White, just a few of the quarterbacks that have passed through the Denver organization in the last two years, along with the guys we have seen today, Mortensen, Penrose, and Hobart. Bob Galliano has been moved to the developmental squad, so that's about 10 quarterbacks that I just mentioned. Nine minutes, 45 seconds remaining in this ball game from Denver. Second and nine. Over Bailey in motion. Hobart under pressure. Throws has a man. Touchdown, Denver. Elmer Bailey. His second catch in a row. The two big plays in this drive. And Ken Hobart gets the gold on the board. Ken Hobart is a great all-around athlete. I like his feet, Tim. He has very quick feet. He competed in a decathlon when he was in college or in high school. That's so Bailey's first touchdown catch, Lee, in 10 games. Wow. Two for two for 79 yards is Ken Hobart, the talented rookie out of the University of Idaho. He rewrote the press guide for the Vandals when he was there. Spielman, 28 of 30 extra points this year have been good. But another one on the win ledger. So, that kick is good. We've got a 36 to 14 ball game. Elmer Bailey and Ken Holbert have excited the crowd. So Ken Holbert comes into the ball game and looks pretty sharp, Cupper. 
I like Ken Hobart when I covered him in college when he was a Division II passing champion of the University of Idaho. We mentioned his all-around athletic ability, having once de competed in a decathlon. Now watch him. I said to comment on his quick feet. Watch how quickly he sets up. Looks to the corner, and Bailey, who has been cold lately, is wide open there. There was obviously a breakdown in the coverage by the Gamblers. I believe Denver was emotionally ready when they came into this ball game. They're trying onside kick here. It hits. 10 yards and it's recovered by Houston so it was legal all the way around right now Elmer Bailey is with Jim Bergamo Elmer your first touchdown catch in 10 games it had to feel very good well I got some pressure off my back it's like that monkey you know finally getting it off your back it felt good what was the difference Hobart comes in hit you with two long pass or a long pass a nice touchdown pass what was the difference I think the difference is we, we finally decided to go long, and that made a difference. That was a T-bow out call where it's basically to the tight end, and he saw me open, and he just threw it out there and gave it to me. All right. Congratulations, Elmer. Houston Gamblers come back, and they change quarterbacks as well. Jim Kelly will save the record touchdown for next week when his family is in attendance. Right now, the quarterback is Todd Dillon. So Jim Kelly will take the rest of the afternoon off. Job well done. Dillon's first pass is complete to Greg Moser, number 85. It's also a first down for the Gamblers. This guy is a good one, Tim. Excellent backup quarterback is number 10, Todd Dillon, out of Cal State Long Beach. One of his receivers there, of course, was Darren Long, who now plays tight end for the Los Angeles Express. But he had all kinds of records for Long Beach State. Mouse Davis told me yesterday at the beginning of the year it was kind of a toss-up between he and Kelly. But as I mentioned at the very top of the show, Miles told me that Kelly has improved as much in one season as any quarterback that he has ever coached. Deep in Denver territory, first down. Long count by Dillon, give the ball straight ahead. That's Daryl Clark out of Texas, number 40, getting the handoff right there. And he was a good one. He was the, the first thousand yard rusher for Texas after Earl Campbell played most of last season with the Arizona Wranglers. Best part about a situation like this Lee Gross Cup is the fact that Jack Pardee now has an opportunity to play a lot of the younger players, a lot of the players that do not usually play that much, and now they're very much in the playoff hunt. That's a good point. That's something he's done all year long. When the Gamblers have gotten into a, a good lead like this, he has utilized his backup players, given them some experience. Second and nine from the 29. Dillon has this pass knocked down. Again, it's Mike Call. Boy, he's played a fine football game and a losing effort. He was looking for number 82, Barus, the wide receiver who was coming across. But you're right about Call. He's a big guy, too. After this game, Houston has Chicago, San Antonio, and Memphis. Standing in their way before the playoffs. Houston, the leader in the Central Division. A win today can keep them two games up on the defending champion Michigan Panthers. And all the remaining games, as you see there, are at home. Third and nine from the 29 for Dillon. Tries to get a quick release, does, out on the flat. The pass is complete to Mark Perus. So Todd Dillon comes in and goes right to work, utilizing that same run and shoot concept that we have talked about, which is basically a total read on the run, both by the quarterback and the receivers, single back offense. There is no tight end in the run and shoot. Two slot backs. There is motion on almost every play. Explain the read. When I say a read, I mean not only the quarterback who's reading the receivers, but the receivers reading the secondary and if it's man coverage, they usually have a break-in route of some kind coverage. If it's zone, they go up again and look for the open areas. And sometimes that will be carried even further. So you can see one, two, three, as many, according to Mouse, as many as five options. Please run 12 seconds off the 30-second clock. They want to take 12 seconds off the 30-second clock. You can hear the referee, Dave Kaminsky. You know, the Washington Redskins run a similar offense. It is a read-on-the-run type scheme. They call theirs the tree branch. When the Smurfs, Alvin Garrett, Virgil C., Art Monk, when they run, 
they branch out depending on what the defense gives them what they read from the secondary and then Joe Theismann reads the receivers boy things have changed a lot when the quarterback just calls the formation and the snap count in the huddle more to come on that concept I like this fourth and two wants to throw does out of bounds incomplete it was intended for Greg Moser good coverage out there by Steve Trimble so Tim because of what you said audibles automatic signals are almost unnecessary because every play is an audible Miles Davis told me yesterday that they've actually only called about 15 audibles all year long because of the fact that it has so much flexibility It was interesting. We were down there talking with Jack Bardee, and I said, play the devil's advocate. If you had to, to defend against your run-and-shoot offense, how would you do it? And he just laughed, never did give it an answer other than say, <laughs> I don't have to. It's my offense. <laughs> Smart. Seven minutes, 13 seconds remaining in this ballgame. Ken Hobart to throw. Elmer Bailey takes one whale of a lick on the 22-yard line. They'll rule it complete and give him the forward progress up to the 23. Kiki Diala is the man that delivered the hit. Ken Hobart, who was two for two before this pass, is throwing the ball to Elmer Bailey, number 83, who really gets a shot from Kiki, Kiki Diala. Got marbles in my mouth as I try to say that name. He's the middle linebacker, number 31, out of Texas. And we talked about his competitive nature and how he'll really give you a shot when you come into his territory. Watch the shot he gets. Another look at the shot that resulted in injury to number 83, Elmer Bailey. Kiki Diala, number 31, the middle linebacker, is in perfect position. And that's an open field clinic. Now, you're a former linebacker yourself, Tim. How good is that? It's an outstanding tackle, and of course, that's the situation a receiver does not like to get into. He was off the ground, had no leverage, had no way to fight back or meet the blow from the defensive back. And of course, Diala just came through him very much. He broke down, as you saw before the tackle, and got all his leverage under him and pushed through his legs and made the hit. Tremendous blast. Hobart now three of three in the passing department for 82 yards since he entered the game, and Bailey has now caught three from Hobart for all 82 yards. I hope he's not seriously hurt. Well, we all hope that. It's a very tough situation to be in for a receiver. And, of course, the good ones are not afraid to take those licks across the middle. They will go up and catch the ball in traffic, knowing full well that they're going to get hit. Craig Martin obviously concerned. He is out there on the field. So is Kiki Diella. He does not want to hurt anybody. So... While there's timeout on the field and while they work on Elmer Bailey, we'll take the timeout as well with a score 36 to 14 gamblers with seven minutes remaining in the ballgame. Elmer Bailey, obviously seriously hurt, has his left arm in a sling and he's walking off very gingerly. Took a tremendous blast from Kiki Diella. One more look at the play that resulted in an injury to Elmer Bailey. Taking it all the way back here, Ken Hobart the quarterback setting up in the pocket throwing over the middle to Elmer Bailey middle linebacker Kiki Diala hits him high and hard and I think it resulted in a shoulder separation the way he was holding himself well you hate to see that shoulder separation we don't know that but uh, that's speculation I don't know what the injury is it just looked that way we saw Anthony Carter take a blow like that earlier this year he was up in the air and Rather than taking a pretty good lick like that, what happened is he was undercut, came down on his arm, on his uh, left arm, and had that broken. He has not returned yet. What a difference that has made in Michigan, Michigan's team. Second and 10 from the 22, Ken Hobart. Still the quarterback for the Denver Gold. Quarterback draw for the 25, 30, 37 yard line goes Ken Hobart. And the rookies put some life in the Denver Gold offense. This guy has been sensational, Tim. I liked him when we covered him earlier with the Jacksonville Bulls. I liked him in college. Division one AA passing leader when he was at the University of Idaho. All big sky. Look at this. Quick feet. 
Good instincts, good running instincts. 13 yard gain by the rookie. He has put life in their offense. First down, Denver. Ken Hobart. Play action. This time, he looks deep. Now comes underneath the coverage. Goes to his tight end, Victor Hicks, into Houston territory. Down to the 47 yard line. Tommy Myers comes up to make the stop. Victor Hicks with the catch. Hobart live arm. And although it's true he's going against a prevent defense, which is not nearly as aggressive as it was earlier in the ball game, now with a commanding lead, he still is putting it on the money. Victor Hicks out of Oklahoma. Tied a single game record earlier this year with six catches in a game. He played on a championship team for Oklahoma in 1975. Played in three Orange Bowls. Hobart, this time rolls left, now throws back against the coverage. It's complete to Williams. Leonard Harris makes the catch at the 26-yard line. This young quarterback is red hot. Ken Hobart, number nine. Watch him go here. Sprint left. It looks like the run and shoot. Five minutes, five seconds left. Crossing pattern to Leonard Harris out of Texas Tech. He's known as Auto Man. Got here at the recommendation of his former college quarterback, Ron Reeves, who was a goal player, now with the uh, Chicago Blitz, and starting for them. Hobart, four of five now. Again, he's working on the first down. This time, a lot of pressure. Sets up the screen. It's Bill Johnson to the 20, 15, down to the 10, inside the 10. He drives to the one-yard line. They say he stepped out on the six. Inspirational effort by this young quarterback, Ken Hobart. Five of six completions now. He sets up the screen to his left. Billy Johnson out of Arkansas State has room along the left sidelines. Lift leg there, juke step. Will Lewis finally makes the tackle close to the goal line. Johnson is hurt after a tremendous effort on that screen play. Vincent White comes into the ball game. A 20 yard gain. And now, That's they Bailey take going out off the Elmer there. Bailey. Hobart now five of six. He's got the corner to the three, the two yard line goes Ken Hobart. Hosea Taylor saved the touchdown. Hobart five of six for 135 yards as we look at Billy Johnson down along the sideline there. And another injured player, Elmer Bailey, going off on a stretcher there. Rough day for the goal. They're beat up already. Physical team, and they've taken a physical beating. We'll try to get you a report on both of the injured players. Right now, Ken Hobart has second and goal from the one. Johnson and Matthews are the setbacks. Two tight ends, a wing. Everybody's tight. It's straight ahead. Touchdown, Denver, Bo Matthews. <laughs> Bo Matthews, a former first round draft choice out of the University of Colorado, follows his blockers right there on the left side. Pretty good surge, and his own energy generates him into the end zone. Good power blocking by George Yarno, Steve Rogers, and Tom Davis. Tommy Davis, as a matter of fact, is still down on the field. So it was Bo Matthews who scored the touchdown. It was Ken Hobart who ignited the spark. Let's try to get an injury report on those Injured players, here's Jim Bergamo. All right, Tim, uh, bad news as far as Elmer Bailey is concerned. As you saw him being taken off on the stretcher, the Denver trainers inform me that they fear he has a broken arm. That is Elmer Bailey. As far as Bill Johnson, the injury doesn't appear to be quite as serious. They're working over his right ankle. At the moment, they feel it is just a sprain of Bill Johnson's right ankle. 
Okay, thank you, Jimmy. As you watch Tom Davis come off, and he appears to be okay. A little bit of a lip. You're talking walking wounded. Well, you hate to see it, too. They're coming down to crunch time. I mean, this is critical time for them. They will probably lose the lead in the Pacific Division today. And every ball game now is critical for the Denver Gold. And as I mentioned, they have Philadelphia, New Jersey, and a red-hot Oakland club. Teams with a combined record of 29 and 13. Ken Hobart now will try to go for two points, trailing 26 to 20, 36 to 20. And this conversion is spoiled by the interception in the end zone by number 35, Mike Mitchell. So they go for two, they fail, but they have the touchdown. Ken Hobart is the hero. The score, 36 to 20, Houston leads. A magnificent day in Colorado. Been a long day. Alabama, the group, put on a spectacular concert before the ball game. 50,000, 57 fans were here to enjoy it. My old pal Chris Schenkel used to say the color in the pageantry of USFL football. And what better way to spend a Sunday afternoon? Thought Chris was here for a second. <laughs> Well, that tells the story, 36 to 20. Time is running short, three minutes and 40 seconds. Again, they will try the onside kick. And again, it is foiled by the upback of Houston, but he really paid the price. He too took a tremendous lick by Bo Matthews. So, Calvin Easton does make a good grab, but he does pay for it. That's interesting. We just saw Bo Matthews moments ago as a runner. Now watch Calvin Eason take this lick. Does a good job, as you say, of fielding the ball. But you can tell that, that Bo Matthews is a little pretty hungry. He wants to hit somebody. He does. Puts the hat on him. Well, it's that point in the ball game where the Denver players just look around and start playing for pride now. They've been embarrassed today, and they want to get back some of the licks. Three minutes, 17 seconds remain. Todd Dillon is the quarterback for Houston, replacing Jim Kelly. So Clark carries it on the right side, picks up a few. Jim Kelly, we repeat, has tied the professional football league record with 36 touchdowns in a single season, tying George Blanda and Y.A. Tittle. His numbers are impressive too, Tim. 20 of 31 in the passing department for 216 yards, two touchdowns. 36 on the year. He says he's going to get the mark next week. There he is right there. I mentioned earlier his hero was Terry Bradshaw. Elway, Marino, Kelly were the top rated quarterbacks coming into 1982. That was the year of the quarterback in college football. What a year it was. Another record that we should mention that has been broken today, of course, is the highest scoring team in football. They needed 35 points coming in. Houston has scored 36 today, so they beat the all-time record set by the 1961 Houston Oilers of the old AFL. Of course, that was a 14-game season with the playoffs. It's a good reminder. Houston, Houston. Now they're putting Johnson on the stretcher, so the ankle may be a little bit more serious than we had anticipated. That injury report's going to be pretty long next week for the Denver Gold. Well, you also saw a shot there of Martin on the bench, number 13. He had his ankle wrapped in ice. Reports on other scores, Arizona over Birmingham 38-28, Tampa Bay beating New Jersey 40-7. Wow. That game now in the fourth quarter. Second and seven. Todd Dillon carries it himself, gets to the 41-yard line. John Bungart's the linebacker, number 57, makes the tackle. Somewhat of a disappointing day for Richard Johnson. He did not score, did not get the 100th catch in front of his ex-hometown fans. Played here at Colorado and also played for the Denver Gold. Five catches, 48 yards today. Billy Johnson out of Arkansas State 
apparently that injury uh, is more serious than we thought. You just mentioned that his right ankle there with ice on it. I assume now they will take a picture of it, make a diagnosis. And we also mentioned that David Martin, number 13, is on the bench. And he has his leg wrapped in ice and has crutches next to him on the bench. So you're losing an all-pro receiver there. I mean, an all-pro defensive back. You know, I started to talk about some of the outstanding quarterbacks from 1982 as we look at David Martin. Kelly, Marino, Elway, of course, were the tops. Reggie Collier was that season, as was Tony Eason, Alan Risher, Witt Taylor, Babe Loffenberg, Tom Ramsey. Just a few. There's David Martin right there. David has ice on both feet, has a leg taped, and also has crutches next to the bench. Third and six for Dillon. Three-step drop. Quick look-in pattern. Scott McGee, and McGee spins loose down inside the 30 to the 27-yard line. Love those quick slant patterns. Todd McGee, another one of the Mouseketeers, running a deep slant in route. That ball was thrown very quick. That's a true timing pass right there, part of the quick passing game. What an effort to pick up an extra few yards as he high-stepped and danced and pranced over the defenders. Three of five now for Todd Dillon after entering the game. He has 35 yards out of Cal State Long Beach where he rewrote their press guide. Vincent Kerrville comes to the bottom of the screen. The handoff onto the left corner. Goes Clark. Clark picks up a few, gets down to the 22-yard line, and he's run out of bounds there. So you look at the Western Conference, Houston and Denver, 10 and 5, 8 and 7, the participants here today. Los Angeles with a win today. We'll go 8 and 7. Michigan has dropped to 8 and 7. Michigan, of course, did win over San Antonio the other night. Arizona is 7 and 8. And Oklahoma 6 and 9. So as we come down to the final several weeks of the playoff drive, the final three weeks, get a pretty good picture of the teams that will make it. Denver is in a skid, having lost five of the last six. They will make it six out of the last seven with this loss here today. Houston, on the other hand, is red hot, and this will be their tenth win of the year. That's Clarence for Dan on the right side, and he doesn't pick up much. And we now have the two-minute warning. So the Gamblers lead it 36 to 20 over the goal. The United States Football League is an exclusive presentation of ABC Sports. Today's game has been sponsored by Light Beer from Miller. Everything you've always wanted in a beer and less by Chevrolet. With the performance, the style, the innovation, the quality and the value that make up today's Chevrolet. By AT&T. The more you hear, the better we sound. And by GMAC, the financing people from General Motors. John Reeves, big day for the Tampa Bay Bandits. They win that one 40 to 14. That's now a final. Arizona wins today to stay in the hunt, 38 to 28. And they keep pace now with Denver and Los Angeles in the Pacific Division. Look at Washington played well, but fell short against one of the hottest clubs in the USFL, that being the young Los Angeles Express, who are now 35 to 21 winners over the Feds. Kevin Mack, another big day. The youngster out of Clemson had 141 yards in 14 carries with two touchdowns. That was an express single game rushing record. And you know, Tim, I talked earlier, in fact, I mentioned this last week, the season this year has had really about three or four different phases. There was the Michigan phase, as we look at Jim Kelly right there. Michigan phase, Birmingham phase, Philadelphia phase. I think the final phase may be the Los Angeles Express. I think they're the hottest team in the league right now. I'll tell you what, don't turn your back on Houston. Not after watching them today, no. Jim Kelly today statistically had his lowest yardage total of the season, but still he was 20 of 31 for 216 yards and two touchdowns. Last week, of course, he was incredible with 20 of 23 for nearly 87% of his pass completions. Intended for Greg Moser, incomplete, overthrown on a slant pattern, quick right side. And Todd Fowler, of course, set a single game rushing record. It's interesting that he broke the record set by his teammate, Sam Harrell, a passing team 
with two rushing records. If we go back to the beginning of this ball game, I think we have to analyze the fact that Denver came out with some gambles of their own, going with five linebackers and six defensive backs, starting this, the game that way to stop the passing attack of Houston. And, of course, Houston went to the running game, and Todd Fowler came up with 208 yards and 21 carries. Tony Fritz now going for his 13th straight field goal. Today, he's hit a 36-yarder, 43-yarder, and a 49-yarder. This one will be from 41 yards. It's blocked. This is Steve Trimble. Catches the block. To the 40, to the 47, 48-yard line. Steve Trimble. So Tony Fritz, who had 12 straight field goals, which tied the record of Tim Mazzetti of the New Orleans Breakers, does not break the record of 13. Watch the effort of Tom Sullivan, number 32, coming from the outside. He's at the bottom left of your picture here. Number 32 leaping in there. Actually, he's not the one who parsed. It's number 71, Mike Call. Mike Call gets the block. Trimble picks it up and makes a great second and third effort here to move the ball down into good field position. Hobart goes back to work out of the shotgun. That's Mike Paul's second block of the afternoon. He's playing a spectacular ball game, and Hobart goes back to work with a completion. And Dave Preston almost breaks it and comes close to the first down. It is a first down for Denver. This sparse Denver crowd now, what's left of a record crowd of 50,000, is pumped up. Preston appeared hurt. He looks like he's all right right now. That man right there, Kiki Diala, number 31, the middle linebacker, looks like he's in pain. Well, how about Ken Hobart's performance today? If we look at a positive side, trying to get away from the injuries. Kiki I Diala, of course, playing well. Matt, Mike Call playing well. Las Vegas, Reno. To amplify on what you were just saying, Tim, Mortensen was 0 for 6, Penrose 5 of 17 for 61 yards. Hobart has come into the ball game here in the fourth quarter. He is 6 for 7 for 147 yards and one touchdown. I think he may have won a starting job for himself for the rest of the season. Earlier this year, we saw John Reeves come in after Wayne Peace had taken his job away, and Reeves has been the starter ever since. He has Tampa Bay winning. You mentioned that Hobart was with Jacksonville earlier this year, and the Bulls tried to turn him into a defensive back. That shows how much athletic ability he has. Remember, he was a decathlon uh, athlete at one time, a decathlete. Well, Kiki Diella now is walking off the field. The injury is to his right leg. So he goes out as well as does Preston, who was injured on the play. Dave Preston. We will show you three games next week in the United States Football League, New Orleans and New Jersey, Los Angeles, Oklahoma, Chicago, Houston, as we come down to the final three weeks of the regular season in the United States Football League. Then, of course, we'll take you all the way through the playoffs up to the championship game in Tampa Bay. This is Harry Sidney. Gets a block from Vincent White down to the 31-yard line. Harry Sidney. Forward handoff out of the shotgun right there to Harry Sidney. This play has been pretty effective for them all year long. Ken Hobart. Ken Hobart. Complete intended for John Arnold. Ken Hobart trying to find John Arnold, wide receiver out of Wyoming. This guy kind of pumps you up, doesn't he, Timmy? Oh, I like his style. Fast arm, quick feet. Good all-around athlete. Obviously good peripheral vision. So necessary in being an outstanding quarterback. Third and one. Hobart will take it himself. Right corner, gets a block, turns it up, and gets the first down. That was by design. He looked like a single wing tailback there. And it makes me think of a right-handed Steve Young. 
Vincent White comes back into the ball game, yells the play to Ken Hobart, and then goes back out with no huddle. They go back to the line of scrimmage from the 28, first down. Incomplete, overthrown, intended for number 84, John Arnold. We are now under the one minute mark with 59 seconds remaining in this game. So with Ken Hobart in the game, Denver has now suddenly put some total offense numbers on the board. Hobart is two for 17 rushing, six of eight passing, and has 147 yards, 164 yards. All purpose is Ken Hobart. My flight just left for Washington. See you around. Second and 10 from the 28 for Ken Hobart. Takes a very deep drop, looks long. Now just drops it off underneath to Vincent White. White sidesteps two tacklers and then runs out of bounds. Mike Hawkins, number 57, knocked him out and we have another injury. The bad news is for the gold is that they're going to lose this football game today. The good news the clock, is that they may have found a quarterback for the rest of the season. Now well, Tony Fitzpatrick was a little bit shaken up, was slow getting up off the ground, now goes back to the defensive huddle. Mentioned how many quarterbacks have been with Denver over the last two years. Even John Gillum was here for a while, remember that? Joe Gillum. Joe Gillum, I mean, yeah, exactly. Ron Reeves, Jeff Knappel. At one point they thought, didn't they, they thought they had signed Steve DeBerg. Third and two for Denver. The ball is at the 20-yard line in Houston territory. Hobart gives it off to Vincent White. Vincent White will go down, and the clock continues to roll. On the negative side today, Denver has injuries to Tom Davis, David Martin, Bill Johnson, Elmer Bailey, Bill Matthews, and Dave Preston. D right there played for Bear Bryant, Texas A&M back in the uh, mid-50s. His senior year was 1957. Also on that team, John David Crow, Jim Stanley, Charlie Kruger. Great ball club played for Bear Bryant. You know, a great accolade to Jack Pardee is the fact that when he coached the Florida Blazers, as you see, Denver got the first down, which stops the clock at 42 seconds. When Jack Pardee closed, coached the Florida Blazers in the World Football League, he took them to the championship, and they played the last half of that season to the players without a paycheck. They did it for Jack. Then he put, took the Chicago Bears to the playoffs, coached the Redskins, was coach of the year in 1976, then got in a power struggle with Bobby Beathard and lost out. But he's back. He's got a red-hot ball club. And Hobart going deep. Intercepted by Will Lewis, his seventh interception of the year. He's the team leader, and that'll be all from the Denver goal today. Happy return to Mile High Stadium for Will Lewis, who was with the Denver goal last year. Went to Houston in the expansion draft. Pass intended for Auto Man, Leonard Harris, number 80. Leaping interception by Lewis in the corner. So, the Houston Gamblers get the ball back with 23 seconds left. Our score, 36 to 20. Well, we just want you to all know that we'll be low rolling all the way to Tampa Bay. Tune in for the Gamblers. Be all there. right, you can hear Will Lewis saying all the way to Tampa Bay, the Houston Gamblers. 16 seconds left in this ball game, and it's all but history. Once again, the final scores, Houston 36, Denver 20. Travel arrangements made through in a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United flies more people to Hawaii than any other airline. Nobody knows Hawaii like United. This has been an ABC Sports presentation. This year, the Olympic tradition continues. We'll be back after this message and a word from your local stations. Stay with us.